you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Super headache. Eight on your microphone is lit. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Do we have slides? I think we have some slides. To oh, share. great, Ms. Norman. Okay, there great. you go. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. You, I think turn that. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, my name is Christina Magana. I work at Tumwata Middle School. I'm one of the AVID instructional coaches there. I'm one of the AVID site coordinator, and I'm also an AVID elective teacher. Um, there is a photo of our AVID scholars out at Western Oregon University this past November. Our seventh and eighth graders visited them for a half day, getting a campus tour, listening to a student panel, having a really impactful day seeing college campuses. Hi, my name is Erin Leninger. I'm the instructional coach at Gardner and the co-site AVID coordinator at Gardner as well. And our students are shown here at, we were at um, John McLaughlin Elementary. Our AVID uh, elective students um, were, they picked a children's book uh, to practice reading in their AVID elective classes. And then we visited the three elementary schools that feed into Gardner and students, our middle school students, read to elementary school students um, at all three of those schools and it was really cute. So that is our group um, pictured at the end of that um, really special day, field trip day. Hi, I'm Kathy Varner and I am the AVID coordinator at Oregon City High School. I'm also an instructional coach as well. And our photo up there is our, uh, most of our AVID group, 9 through 12, and last spring at Portland State University having a campus tour that day. All right, so I'm going to start. We'll share a little bit about um, what AVID is. So this is the AVID mission. So it just reads, AVID's mission is to close the opportunity gap by preparing all students for post-secondary education, career readiness, and success in a global society. And recently, AVID has updated their mission to expand beyond just college and career readiness, but all post-secondary education. Um, so recognizing that any 21st century career involves learning um, in order to grow and improve. And part of the AVID program that we have is called AVID School Wide, and it ex um, it's these four different um, groups. So we've got AVID Instruction. The AVID Instruction group focuses on, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a next slide, Wicker strategies. Um, so those are instructional strategies that are really impactful for learning. Um, the AVID Elective, we have a monthly coaching newsletter that focuses on an AVID instruction strategy. Um, we'd also do tutorials for students, and we do walkthroughs in classrooms to um, observe the different AVID strategies in action. Um, AVID Systems is about data collection and maintaining our AVID strategies school-wide, um, vertical and horizontal alignment of our AVID elective, tutor recruitment and training, and college applications in the high school. Our leadership teams is like the bigger picture of why we focus on AVID. Um, we connect our school's mission and vision to AVID's mission as well, um, and we develop site goals that align with the district and our school priorities. And our culture team is around um, really focusing on that college and career readiness. Uh, we do a college and career fair, guest speakers, um, family nights, and just really promoting college at, uh, throughout the campus with banners and different signs that advertise like where everyone in the building has gone to an educational institution. Um, and so really in order to develop future ready students, that AVID school-wide program supports school setting and implementing, implementing site goals. It helps us shape our professional development for our staff. Um, it really emphasizes that common language throughout the school, which is really good for students. Um, and it just, yeah, each impacts each student. 
And so I, I mentioned Wicker strategies earlier. I'll just give you a second to look these over. Uh, Wicker stands for writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. And the idea is that we're really focusing on those um, big picture strategies and more specific strategies under each of those concepts um, and incorporating those into all of our lessons. Okay, so what is the AVID elective? You may hear about this occasionally. Um, this is for students who elect to be in a focused class where we focus on future readiness for college and career. So what they learn in these classes are to be organized and they learn study skills. They work on critical thinking and asking questions. They get academic help from peers and college tutors. That's usually uh, through the tutorial sessions that they have twice a week. In high school, we have them twice a week. I think middle school is doing them once a week now. Um, they participate in, in enrichment and motivational activities that promote their future thinking. So uh, those activities can include, like you saw, college visits, or we bring people in to talk about college or careers, or uh, we um, those sorts of things to get them prepared. And they also work on planning for their future and investigating other careers they might be interested in. So in the middle school, uh, the main focus is on organizations. You might hear about them talking about their binders and keeping things organized so they're taught how to keep these routines up. Um, we focus on reading and writing, goal setting that's in, in just in classes, but it's also a bigger picture like down the road, classes in high school, careers, things like that. How to take notes, how to organize their notes, how to revise their notes and rewrite notes and use their notes. And um, we also bring in guest speakers. And um, again, you heard, we go on college visits whenever we can. In high school, the focus is more on academic rigor, um, but more in-depth post-secondary post education exploration. And um, when they get a little older, we start writing those college uh, applications, but more importantly, college essay writing is emphasized. They practice um, writing essays in a timed situation, you know, the 10 minutes, write this essay on this topic. Um, and they also get a lot of time to work on searching for scholarships and how to write scholarship letters and all of that. We also have um, school-wide at the high school opportunities for students to fill out their FAFSA uh, and, and get a lot of assistance with that. So now I'm gonna bring up a couple students who are currently juniors at the high school in our AVID program. I have Ella Stiller and Annie Quintana, and they would like to say a, a little bit about what AVID has meant to them. Hello, thank you for joining us. <coughs> Um, hi, I'm Ella, and I'm a junior at Oregon City High School, and I have been in the AVID program for quite a few years now, and I think it's, it's definitely helped me a lot. It has helped me learn how to, like, communicate with, um, like, t older teachers and uh, coordinators and be able to, it's taught me, like, interview skills and also most importantly, it has taught me also how to communicate with my peers in a way that's like helpful to them. Even if I don't know a subject, I can still help them with by asking them questions of like like what kind of source it is and where did they what their like source of their confusion is. Also, Avid has also helped me to uh, organize myself, and I still use these like strategies to this day and. Honestly, the the notes that like have really helped me are Cornell notes, and it's just I even like make my own formats of notes by just like memorization, and it has also helped me to um, <laughs> it has helped me to oh yeah it, it provides an opportunity to uh, advocate for myself, and I feel like I have a voice now because of Avid before it was very difficult to talk about like what I wanted to do with my life and now I feel like I know what I want to do and I will know how to achieve that. OK, 
Okay, hi, <laughs> my name is Annie, and uh, before I say any of this, I just want to say that the AVID elective would not be possible, at least for our class, without Miss Black. She is the <laughs> VIP, the star <laughs> member. She carries us through, so <laughs> just so you all know. Um, AVID has also given me a place to be myself, surrounded by students working toward the same goals as me. And that simple fact has kept me motivated over the years to not disappoint my classmates, and truly I think we are all in this together. I've been able to find a community of people, some of which I consider my closest friends, and it scares me to think that without AVID, I wouldn't have these people by my side. AVID has shown me that I deserve to advocate for myself, and my voice matters, and AVID has given me tools to find that truth. We learn, <laughs> we learn so much every day, and that requires us to think highly and process and analyze our ideas, which has made it easier to do so in real life. And I feel that when I'm faced with a problem, I'm able to take a more meaningful approach because I have tools to deconstruct my fear and self-doubt. And that's something that I gained with AVID. Academically, AVID has been so impactful to me over the years. I think this is proved by the simple fact that so many students, including myself, have taken a break from AVID. And even if it was just for one trimester, it significantly impacted our results academically. But when my classmates and I talked about what keeps us all coming back to AVID, we landed again on our community. Overall, I think AVID has given us a space where we aren't afraid to think highly of ourselves or have nerves about the future. And AVID has given us so many tools that we help, that have helped us throughout our academic careers. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much to our student speakers. Um, and I think just to close, we want to really make clear that there is a AVID school-wide piece that Aaron spoke to, and there is also this AVID elective piece that Kathy and our wonderful student speakers spoke to. The, bowl, the goal for both of them is student success, ultimately. Um, each summer, staff members attend AVID training called Summer Institute, where we write goals for each of our school sites. And you can see them up here. These goals keep us on track for ensuring success for each of our students. They make us critically think about what systems do we have in place to ensure strong instruction for all of our students. Um, and these are our current focuses and often they roll over from year to year as we refine them each year. So thank you so much. And I think our last slide just shows off our seniors from last year of AVID graduation. And yeah, really appreciate everyone hearing us tonight. May so. I just add, sorry, something really quick. And that is that I love hearing from our students here and we know, and Kathy and I have worked on this, um, that we have students that can't experience AVID because it conflicts with other electives that they want to try. So right now we're working to figure out some solutions for that. We really want more kids to have access to this program because I feel like leaving our amazing, amazing middle school programs, kids want to continue with AVID and sometimes they have to make a choice between that and, and another elective they may really want to try or love. So we're working on some work around that schedule that's adult things to fix mm -hmm. um, but um, we love hearing from you and seeing how it could be really valued and hoping to really expand um, even more from where we are now so thank you all for being here thank, thank you very much yeah. okay next on the agenda Fabrication Lab, James Martin and Daniel Rogers. Welcome. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> make sure the green yep, light is, is lit. Up. We want to make sure to put some student projects in your hands because it's, uh, we didn't invite any kids. We should have invited some kids. We really should have. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, let's see. We have some slides as well. So, Great. Uh, I don't know. If, oh, here they are. Right here. Um, so I'm James Martin. I teach the art and design aspect of uh, what Dan and I do. Dan teaches the tech components, and uh, together we run the whole space. And, um, and, and we're trying to collaborate a little bit more and kind of bring tech and art and design together. Working. Thank you. There Thank you. Go. you Do I Evan. need to repeat all that or are we okay? No, I think we're good. All right, great. Um, and so uh, 
we both have similar goals in our programs, um, but uh, we also have some individualized things that we do. Uh, art and design is a uh, response to one of the big problems with middle schoolers. If anybody's ever been around a middle schooler, uh, one of the things they don't like to do is endure through assignments. They like to try it once, if, if you're lucky, and then uh, they will give up on you. They're like, well, I did it already. And so both art and design and tech are really designed to approach that problem, right? Uh, so how do we get kids to iterate and, and try again and try again and try again, even when it's exhausting? Um, I used to be a social studies teacher, and it was really, really tough to get kids to try writing essays in different ways. Uh, and what I'm finding is it's, it's as difficult to get them to do that with art, uh, which is surprising to me because I was an art kid growing up, and I loved doing it in multitude of ways, right? So anyway, with art and design, uh, that's, that's the goal, right? It's how do we get kids to, uh, to iterate and go through the, uh, the design thinking process. And, um, and so what I want to show you is just one project that I've been doing uh, as, uh, with the kids in art and design, uh, which is a mural project. It's a public art project. And, and use it sort of to illustrate the design thinking process. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but uh, there's a sort of building of empathy, understanding the problem. Uh, there's a challenge involved. There's iteration. Uh, there's prototyping. There's testing. And then, hey, let's go back and try it again, right? So uh, I, whoever's got the button. Uh, we could go through, there we go. So the challenge, I, if anybody's been to Tumwater, um, it's a beautiful new school uh, with a lot of very bald hallway, right? It's, it's just uh, like, we've got about 450 feet in our hallway probably that are just walls that look like that. And that's the entrance to our fabrication space, right? And, um, and so it's, it looks almost institutional and, uh, you know, so the kids and I were talking about, wouldn't it be cool if we were to do something? Uh, I, I brought the conversation up with Ben, uh, Ben Cates, and he's, yeah, let's do it, right? And make sure you talk to Matt Johnson, sure, the head custodian. And so uh, we said, uh, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. So I issued the challenge to the kids, and um, go, there we go. And we, bang, we began to iterate. We, be, we began to come up with some ideas, and uh, kids, you know, so many kids came up with so many different ideas. Um, and then we started to kind of near towards, well, it's going to be this, I don't know, planetary, galactic kind of theme. Um, we talked to Dan uh, about, like, hey, what would you like to see uh, for the tech stuff? And, uh, and so the kids kind of did a little bit of interviewing, so to speak, you know, and uh, we just kept on drawing, kept on drawing, they, they, they worked together, um, and ideas just kept on blowing up, which was really cool. And uh, once we'd iterated a little bit, uh, we began prototyping, right, and thinking, okay, well, what's it going to look like? Now we're going to actually put things up on the wall and see what it looks like in tape and in pencil, and is this something we really want to commit to? Because as soon as you put paint onto a wall, uh, well, you know, <laughs> there's not much undoing. Uh, so we kind of went through that process. There was a lot of conversations with kids, a lot of excitement. It was amazing to me to see um, how much enthusiasm there was school-wide. There's kids who weren't in our programs who suddenly were like, oh, oh how, do we get, how, do, how do we get to be part of this? Uh, so the buzz was really, you know, I mean, it was, it was palpable. Um, moving along, uh, then we test. Then we start putting paint on a wall. Uh, some of that paint we ended up rubbing off, you know, <laughs> some of that paint we uh, uh, ended up painting over. Um, but it was, it was a lot of fun to see this happening. People kept on walking past. So there, was, there was a number of kids who would walk on through and just, oh my gosh, I can't believe what you guys have done today. Uh, a lot of excitement. Um, as you can see, all just working away and uh, working as class. What was really cool is there were three classes of kids doing this. Um, and, uh, and they managed to collaborate even as three classes, you know, which was uh, really, really impressive. I think the most fulfilling part for me to see how an idea could happen in first period and we'd follow through uh, through third, fourth period. Um, I'm not sure what else we did. Let's see. Uh, we tested. Oh, yeah, of course, collaboration, that piece, right? Now you get to see it in color because it's getting close to done. Uh, and I still actually have kids who are coming after school because uh, the semester ended. I got new kids and I still got six or seven kids who are coming after school and doing a little bit of work with me, uh, sort of on a daily basis. And we're still finishing up, but as you can see, it's 
it's a new entry to the space, right? And uh, and that's kind of what the program's all about. Is like let's find uh, let's let's find the problem and let's see what we can do to you know make it better. Um, and I think I've got one last little slide in there, which uh, was the first project of the year. And one of the big challenges, of course, uh, was that Tumwata did not have a logo. Uh, for those of you that have ever seen a Tumwata sweatshirt uh, in the last year, it just says Tumwata Middle School. Uh, kind of bland, kind of boring. Um, but then uh, we put a challenge out to the kids. The one on the left, uh, there's a student, Aubrey Trine, who is an eighth grader. Uh, who came up with uh, this after about 15 to 25, I can't remember how many she did, but she did so many different sketches. Uh, they worked with her friends, they developed, um, and this is what she came up with. And then once we put it into Photoshop and we uh, fiddled around with it a little bit, it became that, and now it's on our sweatshirts. Uh, it's on our newsletter. It's, um, uh, and, and one of the kids who's helping me on the mural right now is Aubrey, and she's, uh, you know, I told her, I was like, going to the boards and I'm gonna wear your sweatshirt, I wanna show everybody, and she's like, oh my gosh, my mom's so excited about this. And uh, it was, um, it's just, it's really cool, right? And so that's art and design, and we are really, really trying to integrate into what tech is doing, and Dan and I have a lot of plans for the future. We're just, the plans might be bigger than what the kids are ready for yet, but you know, we're trying it out. Sure. Yeah. I think we're out of time, right? I think we yeah, should, we that should might be it. I don't <laughs> say anything. You, you covered all of our minutes. So. Uh, my name is Dan Rogers. I am the technology teacher at Tom Mata. I'm also the um, electives team leader. And so I get to work with James as well as our Spanish program choir and band uh, and our peer mentoring. My class is, it's hard to put into a category as you look at some of the stuff in front of you. This, these 3D models that are kind of in front of you. Uh, represent like a kind of a new era for my class getting to do digital sculpting uh, but some of the more traditional stuff that we cover basically graphic design videography photography 3d modeling audio engineering Photoshop um, I have students using professional software Adobe products uh, in seventh and eighth grade and they're they're crushing it they're doing amazing work and I feel like I'm hopefully setting them up for careers in some of these industries so uh, next slide please yeah some examples, I know it's, it's weird to see a, a llama and a panda together, a palama uh, <laughs> up here, but students love anamorphine in Photoshop, doing portrait photography. Um, I don't know if you know this, middle school students love to see themselves digitally. Uh, so they, they tend to enjoy the process of capturing themselves. Uh, one of my favorite assignments is having them create comic books, taking pictures throughout the school and coming up with narratives, so blending language arts programs and kind of mixing up their, their standards a little bit. Next slide, please. Here's an example of my iteration process. Um, this is a student's uh, project, Matthew Krause. They, they, they did an amazing job. Um, it's, a, it's about a three-week process as they learn the tools in Blender, but getting to see their daily process and like capturing it, putting it into a, a digital portfolio, and then I think it's sitting right in front of you there. Uh, and that student actually printed his own at home, so kids starting to have like these these um, technologies in their house and getting to see the relevance of learning the skill uh, is, is one of the, the joys of my, my career. I think one more slide. Um, this is just a representation of my final projects. I have students do an independent project where they get a look back and reflect on the semester and kind of come up with an assignment, but I was blown away this year. I didn't think it was going to be a huge success and some of the project, projects that they created from that uh, vector project of uh, Nat King Cole and some Lego stop motion, and then I had a group of gentlemen who created a very weird but very beautiful Western, uh, <laughs> and they mimicked a lot of Clint Eastwood movies and, and scenes, and it just, it made me almost cry, but uh, Oscar worthy at least. Um, I don't know if we have any time, but if there are any questions, if you guys want to ask of our program, by chance, feel free to throw them at Mr. Martin over here. <laughs> Is there a similar program to this in Gardner as well? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's Great. the Fab Lab. They call it the Fab Lab over there. And uh -huh. they, uh, they are lucky enough that they have the wood shop as well. Um, so we just, we didn't have the space in the redesign. Uh, but uh, yeah, Gardner has the, the, wood, la uh, the wood shop and the, um, and the uh, tech room and the art room. Same sort of situation. And does this carry through to the high school? Does the high school also have this capability? Um, the Fab we, Lab over there. Uh, you know, the high school has an art program. Obviously, mm -hmm. they have a tech pro uh, a tech program. Um, they, we have ceramics, which is awesome. And the high school, you guys don't get 
ceramics up at the high school. I don't think there's. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, I, it's honestly this is one of the greatest parts of my world right now as I get to teach ceramics, and uh, and it's it's real. We have like a, an incredible kiln and uh, wheels and and everything. Um, the high school doesn't have the um, uh, uh, the ventilation for it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, they can't. It's it's not a safe thing to do if you don't have ventilation um so uh you know they do they they, they have an art pro I, I love to think that maybe we've got a better program you know, <laughs> <laughs> i'm not saying that, that on record yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. that's wonderful have you thought about having an art show or an open house for your art because i i for one would love to see that yeah <laughs> now, I, I think the one of the coolest things last year was getting to see the student learning celebrations at the end of the year, which I believe we're adding into the, the fall of next mm -hmm. year. But mm -hmm. students often pick our projects to represent themselves um, at the learning celebrations. But uh, we are in the, the works of planning a, a art slash fundraiser. We don't really have a, a word for it yet for bringing families in to, to showcase uh, all of our electives. So an elective night in the fall of, or winter of next year. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. I can't remember where our date was. Was it Chris? I can't remember if it was uh, sort of the winter so, time or. Uh, let's not get into specifics we don't know. Yeah, we don't want to make <laughs> specifics yet, right? But uh, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got our band and choir teachers as well as Christina, I think. Yep, yeah, right? You're, you're still in, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and we want to we want to go big with it, right? So to have that sort mm -hmm. of thing and offer a whole bunch of exposure to what it is that we're doing over there, uh, get some families in to check it all out. For a request, just don't do it on a Monday night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we plan for a Thursday, maybe. Thir I think yeah. Thursday. That yeah. seems to be when we do everything. Right. <laughs> all right. May I? Yes. I just wanted soul. to offer some quick praise. Thank you so much. For your, you're really offering students such life-changing opportunities and at middle school. I like how you point out something you all have that the high school can't have and maybe that's better the error in that direction because you've got foundational stuff happening at such young ages. They'll carry that through into being te uh, older teenager artists. Um, and the technical opportunities, wow, I mean, th these are skills they could learn into their career, their art, both. And it's, I like that you brought up a multidisciplinary aspect mm -hmm. and a connection to language arts, for example. And of course, mm -hmm. connection to other types of academics is there as well. So you're, you're stimulating their growth and their academics across, across the board and with something that's all creative. So it's just, it's perfect. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank Very you. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Thanks for bringing the samples. It really oh, brings it home. Yeah. Thank you. They want them back really bad. So yeah, I bet they yeah. do. They're pretty cool. We won't keep them. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Competition between Gardner and Ogden, a little, oh. little cross-town rivalry. <laughs> we used to have that as an as an Ogden alumni. We would battle the other schools. That's right. Well, it, if you're not competing, you're not trying. <laughs> Your things? I don't think it's even on. All right, uh, next item, Kindergarten Connect, Dr. Sarah Deboy and Hasita Ortiz. Good evening. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, we just want to make everybody aware of upcoming Kindergarten Connect nights. Um, this is for all families with students that will be five years old by September 1st. The class of 2036, which sounds really crazy. <laughs> wow. Um, for uh, all of our um, elementary schools, except Todos Unidos, who has a special program, and um, Principal Ortiz is going to talk about that. But for all of our other elementary schools, February 21st at 6 p.m. is the night. Some of the schools are offering Zoom. Some are offering in person. Um, you need to see your school's website, your home school's website, for all of those details. And then you can see for Todos Unidos, they have, they've had one information session. They'll have another on February 28th from 6 to 7. And then their um, official Kinder Connect will be March 14th from 6 to 7. And then if you just go to the next slide, please. 
Um, there will also be some spring open houses, and these are also in person for that same group. This was a system that we tried last year that was very successful. We know that some of our parents really rely on having a Zoom information night because they're at home with their small children, maybe don't have childcare. But then as their kids are getting a little older and connecting to what it means to go to school, it's nice to have an opportunity to come and visit as well. And then I'm just going to turn it over to Principal Ortiz to talk about what it looks like at Todos Unidos. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we have a lottery program for our program, and so uh, starting on February 1st, student or families regist can start filling out lottery cards um, to show their interest in our program. And so on April 1st, uh, we will hold the lottery, and we have space for about 100 students is what we're projecting for next year, but we wanna have a balanced classroom. So that means that we're looking for um, our, to have a mix of English speakers and Spanish speakers so that our students can learn together in both languages. And so um, in our community, we're looking for getting about a third um, true English speakers, a third that are simultaneous bilinguals, and a third that are um, native Spanish speakers. And the simultaneous bilingual students um, are students who identify as Hispanic or Latino and who may have um, Spanish around them, like through grandparents or maybe one of their parents, but it's not their primary language. And so they're kind of learning a little bit of Spanish along the way. We wanna make sure that they have space in our program so that they can maintain those cultural connections as well. And so um, we will hold the lottery for in Oregon City School District residents on April 1st. Um, and what we will do, we have four priorities. One of them is for students that are, um, now I'm like totally spacing. Students that, Students that are, I've totally lost it. <laughs> That's okay. Is it siblings? We have four priorities. Um, oh, siblings is the first priority. So siblings of our students that are already in our program. The second one is for students who identify as Hispanic or Latino. The third one is if you live in Oregon City School District, anywhere in the district. And the fourth one is for out of district residents. And so we hold our lottery for the first three priorities first. And then on May 15th, we hold our lottery for this, that last priority of out of district families. Any questions for us about Kindergarten Connect? can't believe it's that time of year, but here we are. Yeah. So we're excited for all of our existing and our new families to come and check it out and get excited about school starting for their, yes. their little ones. Thank so you. How, okay. how, I, Thank I have a question. Oh, yeah. Just a quick question. How are we letting people know about this? It is on the website. It's been put in yeah. newsletters. I know that our wonderful um, communications director has been putting the word out. So we try to put it in as many places as possible. What am I missing? Yes, I think we've got it on social media and yeah, all kinds of media. places, anywhere cool. and everywhere. And area preschools I could attest to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have been attending Head Start um, parent nights as well to share information about Great. it. Yeah. yeah. And just to follow up, so you had an informational Zoom, you're doing that now, but when you have in the spring, you have the in-person come in the classroom, that's after parents already know if their students are going to be in class after April 1st? Or? Ours is going to be on March 14th, and so it's actually before, so um, it really, we really want families to come in and see our program and know that this is really something that they want to do um, before they commit. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, recognition and good news about Oregon City Schools. Classified Staff Week, March 6 through 10, 2023, Lisa Norman. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to recognize that in March, um, we celebrate our Classified Staff Appreciation Week, which falls this year, March 6 through March 10th. We have about a little over 350 classified staff members that are employed in our district. And so I would like to read the proclamation that we have. Thank you. Um, yeah, to honor them. 
Oregon City School District School Board proclaimed March 6th through 10th, 2023 to be Classified Employee Appreciation Week. Whereas the education of youth is essential to the future of our community, state, country, and world. And whereas classified employees are the backbone of our public education system. And whereas classified employees work directly with students, educators, parents, volunteers, business partners, and community members. And whereas classified employees support the smooth operation of offices, the safety and maintenance of buildings and property, the safe transportation, healthy nutrition, and direct instruction of students, support with remote instruction, and delivery of food and instructional materials. And whereas our community depends upon and trusts classified employees to serve students. And whereas classified employees with their diverse talents and true dedication, nurture students throughout their school years. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Oregon City School District proclaims March 6 through 10, 2023, to be Classified Employee Appreciation Week. And be it further resolved that the Oregon City School District strongly encourage all members of our community to join in this observance, recognizing the dedication and hard work of these individuals. Congratulations to our classified staff. Yes, yes, thank you. And we are not in March, but we won't have a board meeting before then. So we wanted to make sure that we were timely in recognizing all those staff members. Thank you. Uh, next item up is Black History Month, Dr. Sarah Dubois. Thank you so much. This is just a quick look at what's happening across some of our schools, really all of our schools, but we just took a snapshot from a few to celebrate and honor National Black History Month, which is for the month of February. At Oregon City High School, they have a display of authors set up in the library, African American and Black authorship. They also have um, lots of Black and Afri African American role models and quotes attributed to them throughout the school set up in their display cases. At Candy Lane, this is just an example of one of their bulletin boards that has um, really cool, this is, I wish you could see it up close, but it says things like um, dream like Martin, um, compose like Scott Joplin, invent like George Washington Carver. Um, ready for the next one? For uh, Beaver Creek, there was a number of activities. One was a book table, which was an opportunity for teachers to sign up to have a book read to their classroom or for a chance for students to explore books that are highlighting black history and black characters. They had a bulletin board that reminds students to challenge, lead, dream, write, and learn like black historical leaders. Um, some compare contrast between Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks. And uh, like Dr. M Martin Luther King bulletin board, where second graders wrote about how they can make the world a better place. At Gardner, they've been having um, announcements um, focusing on contributions of African American and black um, people to the United States, honoring black people from all periods of US history. And then final example from Holcomb, um, one activity students in their AISP classes wore lanyards with well-known African American people on it with facts about them on the back. They wore a different one each day of the week and other students and staff asked them questions about their specific individual. Activity two, you can see up in the corner, an art activity for second grade class celebrating the artistic work of Alma Woodsy Thomas. And that was just a little sampling of what's going on around the district. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next topic, Educational Equity Conference, Dr. Sarah Dubois and Dr. Dale Spitzer. Excellent, so last Friday we had our um, Educational Equity Conference and just a huge shout out to Dr. Dubois, Rob Robinson, um, our curriculum coordinator and about 20 staff throughout our district who helped plan that. It was a lot of planning and looking at uh, proposals of people who wanted to, to share and, and great leadership um, for this conference. So it's an internal conference where our staff attends and uh, we use the National Equity Project's lens on educational equity, specifically reducing the predictability of who succeeds and who fails, interrupting um, reproductive practices that negatively impact vulnerable and marginalized students, and cultivating the unique gifts and talents of every student. 
And this year's educational equity focus based on data was just really focused on our students, um, you can go to the next slide, our students who um, might be experiencing uh, one form or another of a learning disability. And so we invited Ladera Horn to come and speak to our staff and it was a great kickoff and I will let Dr. Huh. Boy, talk a little more about that. Yes, we were very privileged to have Lederick with us. Um, he is an individual who experiences a learning disability um, and was diagnosed with that in the third grade. Um, he uh, talks about kind of that experience of what it was like in that time, which was several years ago, and some of the isolation and um, some of the sadness that went with it in his own life and how he persevered through some of those things. Um, so he has become an advocate for people with disabilities, and he also is a poet, which was really wonderful to listen to him. Um, some of the amazing poetry that he found as his gift through some of his teachers in high school. Um, so it was just a great gift. And then he ended up staying with us and just talking with teachers and going to sessions and just getting to know the people of Oregon City. And it was just a wonderful experience to have him with us. Here's just some of the conference details. Um, within the conference, we have a keynote that everyone attends, and then we have four sessions that have choice within each session. There were 57 different sessions for people to choose from um, this year. We had 50 internal presenters and 14 external presenters. Some uh, sessions are co-presented. We had two student panels this year, one for our current students um, and some for our former students to talk about what was helpful to them as uh, students that had IEPs um, to help them go into um, the next phase of their life. As Dr. Spitzer mentioned, we had about 20 people in the planning team, and big shout out, we had over 20 student volunteers that sat at the front table. They showed presenters where their rooms were. They made sure everybody had their name badges. It was really great to have them. Um, the strands for the sessions that um, people could identify are along the, along the right-hand side there. Inclusion, neurodiversity, differentiation, and access to grade level instruction, assessment practices, responding to bias, culturally responsive practices, and parent and community engagement. The next slide gives just one snippet of conference feedback. This just happened on Friday, so we're still processing all of our feedback. Um, but this is uh, for session one, two, three, and four. Um, the feedback on the question, the content was valuable and relevant to my position, with five being high. So there you can see um, the ratings from um, the people that were involved in that for each of the four sessions. And we are asking for more feedback for the conference as a whole, um, what was missing, what's needed, what was um, an impact on their practice, and as we get that pulled together, we'd be happy to share that with you going forward. Final slide, we always have an activity that we like to engage in that puts students at the center, and I, I sort of made this up, I'm going to own that, but we decided we were going to do a post-it frenzy. Um, we had big packs of post-its at the front when people came in, and you could write an inspirational note to students and leave it anywhere you wanted in the building. Um, so I just had great joy at the end of the day of walking around and taking pictures of the post-its that were left for kids um, that say things like, you belong here, you got this, you have so much to share with the world, you're loved, reimagine again and again, you're a gift to this world, we believe in you. Just a few of the many, I'm super sorry to our custodians, but to the many post-its that were left for this morning for kids to come to, you can see them all along the lockers going down the hall there, and they were on posts, and um, I put mine on the AED machine, they were all over the place. So it was just a, a nice feeling, and the outpouring of love for kids um, was very, very evident. So. Any questions we can answer for you? I just want to say thank you for all of the work, putting it together, putting it on, attending it. Um, the survey feedback is always really interesting as far as, you know, teachers, all of the staff attend a lot of professional development. Mm -hmm. And so when you're asking, is this relevant to my job? And seeing such a high level of response of, this, this does make a difference in what they do every day um, is really great feedback for us to hear as we're planning and you're planning in the coming years. Thank you.
Yeah. Oh, thank you. And it's true. In adult learning, I think the, there's two key pieces here. One, they want to learn from each other and the voices of experience within their classrooms. And two, adult learners want choice in what they attend. <laughs> so the fact that they can go through, I think we had about um, almost 15 session choices in each session. That's yeah. a lot of choice. That's we were hard. also really lucky in that um, the first nine f that filled up the fastest, I just shot a quick email and said, would you please consider presenting twice? And all of those were able to accept one. So we were able to duplicate things if people weren't on the front end of selecting. So we were just very fortunate to have so many presenters and people willing to share. So um, I attended the afternoon session and I had planned to report on that during my little bit of time. So I just wanted to let you guys know that I will do that then. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Chair Phil Pot, right. can I just add one more comment? Yes. I just received a note that um, indicated that the students loved the sticky notes that they found this morning. Maybe uh, Evan can confirm or deny I that. But ask Evan about the that. message I got was that they liked them a lot. Oh, uh, that's great. Um, they loved them. They were like putting them on each other's backpacks all day. It was really <laughs> fun. Most of them ended up on the floor. Yeah. So sorry to our yeah. custodians. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Thank you. So we are now to the point in the agenda, Evan, where we'd like to hear from you. So if you could give us more information on how things are going at Oregon City High School. Okay. Um, I'm going to start off with our winter formal. Um, winter formal assembly went really well. There was a lot of student involvement. There was a lot of games. Like everyone had at least a little fun there. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I didn't go to winter formal personally, but everyone else said it was really fun. They liked all the decorations that um, student council put up and all the backdrops and posters that went into that. Um, we're going to do a class comp volleyball uh, practices, I think, started this week. And our college and career director, uh, Erica Forfeard, I don't really know how to say her last name, um, is leading that for us. And then um, one of our exec members is building or rebuilding our garden by the student council room. It's going to be used for our uh, SLC class for their, um, for their curriculum, and we will use it for a flower memorial to Bianca. We just leveled it out. Um, sh uh, our shop class is building the beds. Um, and then our freshman committee is putting on Dub For Your Love, which is where we're gonna give out, or our freshmen are gonna give out um, chocolates. Um, you pay like a dollar or something for a few chocolates in a really cute bag, and they put a lot of work into it, and they did all of it by hand. It was really cute. Um, and they're going to go out tomorrow, tomorrow's Valentine's Day? Yeah, <laughs> tomorrow. Um, and then this week we have a toy drive going on that is put on by uh, our key club. They're doing amazing and they've worked very close with me. Um, last week was our dress drive. It didn't go as successful as our first one, which was really sad. But that was on me because I didn't put enough stuff out. <laughs> um, and then our canned food drive is coming up at the end of the month. If you guys have any toys, dresses, or cans that you can donate, you can really just drop it off in the main office. Um, and then going on to what's happening in our school, um, our cheer team just took fourth in our co-ed um, traditional, which was really cool. State looked so much fun. We hosted it, hosted it at um, Oregon City this year. Um, our JORTC just competed in Sheldon, Washington. Um, their unarmed is usually placing first and second in most of their comps lately, while their armed is usually placing third. Um, and their state is on March, 5th, uh, March 25th. Um, and they'll most likely be going for how they've been placing lately, which is really fun. And um, what can go up in the school 
guidelines are looking really well and I <coughs> looked over them and I voted on how like it's going and I was supposed to talk to Mr. Zika today but she had a meeting so it's all right um yeah oh and unity our unity committee actually added onto the sticky notes because most of them came down today <laughs> but some of them went up in the uh, bathrooms on the mirrors and it was really nice. Yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm actually an avid too and the college fairs and opportunities that have, um, that have been given to me are amazing and the college fairs are always fun and you meet a lot of amazing people there even if they're not going to your school or like they're not the adults that you're talking to to get into those colleges. You're meeting amazing people going anyways. Thank you, Evan. We appreciate you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the updates. I'm curious to know about the class called volleyball. Is that actually about volleyball or is it about something else? No, class called volleyball is like about volleyball. Um, <laughs> Sometimes sorry. the obvious is not always, right? I like, <laughs> so wasn't sure. Our, our um, college and career director, um, Erica, is actually our um, head coach for volleyball. Uh, so she's running like practices. She's there every day setting up nets uh, the days that they're having practices for that. Okay. So there's a lot of prep going into it, and everyone's going to practices. They're telling everyone that they're having so much fun actually going. And, like, um, I don't really remember when the actual game's going to go on, but um, I'll let you know next month. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fun. Thank you. Okay, and as always, if you would like to leave now that we've done your portion, you can, or you can stay for as long as you'd like. <laughs> okay. It's good to see you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Ms. Norman, do we have any OCEA or OSEA communications? We do not tonight. Um, Gail Prentice Wood had planned on being here, but unfortunately something came up. She wasn't able to make it, so she sends her apologies to you all, and Brenda was not able to attend this evening. Okay. Thank you. All right, moving on to uh, patron input. Ms. Norman, do we have patron input today? We do have patron input. Um, there is no input via Zoom. There is, I believe, a printed out you received an electronic mm -hmm. submission. Um, we have several on the list tonight. So I will um, read our procedures um, before we call people up. The Oregon City School District Board of Education highly values public input in making important decisions that affect, affect Oregon City's children and community. To ensure the public has an opportunity to offer comment during school board meetings and to ensure that the board can conduct the important business of the district, speakers must observe certain basic rules of conduct. The following guidelines apply to all public comment. All members of the public attending school board meetings must treat each other and the board with respect. No hate speech is allowed. Individuals are not permitted to engage in conduct that interferes with the ability of other individuals to observe the board meetings interferes with the ability of other members of the public to offer comment to the board, or interferes with the ability of the board to conduct its business. Members of the public may offer objective criticism of school operations and programs, but the board will not hear complaints concerning specific school personnel or other authorized individuals. Complaints of this nature shall be addressed through Public Complaints Policy KL-AR. Please keep your comments concise as you will have three minutes to speak you will receive a one-minute warning. Please state your name and your affiliation when you come to the dais. I would first like to ask Rachel Grimmer to come forward. Good evening, Ms. Grimmer. Push it again and see what happens. 
now top. Just kidding. It wasn't on. <laughs> Most people do that. Oh they goodness, actually it think like it, was it gets brighter. <laughs> do you want me to start over or no? Just okay. That's okay. Okay. Sorry but about we that. We won't. We won't dock your time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that working, Michelle? Okay. okay. Yeah. We're good. Thank we'll you. start you again. Oh, start again? Yes. Okay. No, right. we'll start your time again. Okay, perfect. I'll just start where I was. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, for over a year and a half, we have brought facility issues to your attention, many of them safety issues. We have written emails, made phone calls, held numerous meetings with members of the school board, and each time we've been told something would happen and that it would be taken care of. But to this date, none of these issues have been fixed. The support posts in the varsity dugout are still rotting and at risk for the roof to collapse. The fence around the varsity field still has a gaping hole allowing access to the field and leaving coaches and players to find dog poop and trash that they have to clean up. Broken sp sprinkler lines continue to leak causing field damage and wasting district resources. Rotting siding, trim, and damaged roof flashing on both the varsity and JV dugouts are going to eventually lead to loss of structure. These are still no safety railings around the JV dugouts to protect the players. Water fountains in the varsity dugouts still don't work and there's no running water at the JV fields. I could continue this list but for now I will leave you with that. Meanwhile parents and the booster club have stepped up and spent over $10,000, as well as countless hours in repairs and improvements. We held numerous field days to repair what we could, power washed, cleaned, painted the dugouts, filled the dangerous holes around the area for our spectators, and spread over a ton of gravel. Parents routinely volunteer to mow, edge, and weed the fields. We have paid to replace a broken mowing tractor and covered maintenance and repairs of other district equipment. And here we are one month from the start of the baseball season and we're still not on playable fields. We are beyond frustrated and disappointed. We are not asking for gold-plated pitching machines or even moderate field or facility improvements. We are simply asking to address the safety issues for our baseball players. We have demonstrated our willingness to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work. We have offered time and again to partner with you to address the concerns. We have put our players and coaches first in every turn. When will you make their safety a priority? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to inv invite Felipe and Catherine Stewart to the front, and they are asked for three minutes total. Even though there's two of them. Thank you. Good evening. Please make sure that the light is on brightly. There you go. Hello. Um, my name is Catherine, and I am a parent of a freshman who attends Oregon City High School. Um, I am here because we have previously filed a complaint um, and the people who we entrust to to be there for our children and hear our children and take their needs seriously are not doing their jobs. Um, we've been lied to over and over again and And we've trusted these people to be honest about the inappropriate and unrelated content being talked about and shown in classrooms, as such as the gender queer book reading via YouTube. This book has nothing to do with what my child needs to learn in school. Um, promoting CRT with Ibram Kendi videos is just not what my child is going to school for. Um, I was told that I would be sitting down with the superintendent and that she would meet with us and we again we were let down. It's unfortunate because I deserve to be heard as a parent. Um, 
it's been a very frustrating process and I feel as if we've gone through the motions and done all the right things and we're not being heard and we are not giving we're not being given the time to um, be heard or listened to or even conversate about any of the content that we've gone over and over with via email and such um, and I really this <laughs> this really makes me understand why other parents don't want to go through this process. It's grueling, it's time consuming, it always feels like you get the short end of the stick as a parent. Um, One minute. The PI that was hired by the school district conducted an inv inv investigation that highlighted the lies that we were told by people in the school district. We sat down and went over paperwork and we were offered no resolution. We were offered no communication. It was just, here's what we found. And in here is a bunch of lies. It's information that's been misconstrued over and over again. Um, and that's not true equity. That's not equality for um, my child or us as parents either um, and I really look forward to hearing from you on this important matter and I hope that my voice as a parent can be heard and our questions can be answered because we have asked a lot of questions and we have yet to receive any answers thank you to any your of them. time is up thank you thank you Thank you. I'd like to invite Tanya Streifel to the front, please. I hope I said that. You might have to correct it. Okay, good. If, if it's bright green, it's on. If it doesn't look like it's bright green, yeah, it try it and see what happens. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tanya. Um, my students actually used to go to Oregon City School District, but we moved out of, out of the city. But I'm here just in support um, as an Oregon Moms Union representative and as a parent, um, talking a little bit about the hot topic of the banned book week um, that took place in the high school in Oregon City. Um, I have a, it's just, it's a hard decision, a hard decision as a district because I know even though um, we are following your direction as school board, you're an elected official that we look to to guide our school district in the right direction for all, for all children. Um, there's a lot of other voices that are coming from all directions in the state of Oregon. And so some of those decisions are, are hard decisions. And so I understand that when presented with facts, it's going to make it's going to be a hard decision to make for you. And I, I just understand that we trust you. We care about you. As school board members, you are an elected official by our community. And we care so much about how you represent us. So um, parents trust you. Um, and we look forward to what your res resolution will be um, after the end of the meeting today. Um, true equity. What is that? Equity is allowing all students to be heard, allowing all students to be represented and to feel included, no matter what their beliefs are. And it feels a lot like the hot topic equity children or parents or teachers have a bigger voice. And some of us conservative families that believe a certain way feel as though our voices are quieted and that we can't speak out. And I think that's the main miss in public school is even though we represent so many children. I personally work as a paraprofessional in public school. So I see every child equally. I love all those children. I try and represent and respect every single viewpoint. But it seems as though some One viewpoints minute. are not respected. The chain of events for just one family here that I'm helping to support uh, reveals some gaps in the process. We hope that other parents don't, don't have to experience those gaps. So maybe there is some some movement for process for an ex, um, sorry excuse me for improvement. Schools in the public sector do not have a thorough process to allow parents to filter or approve books, especially when it comes to teachers bringing in their own selection to the classroom. Um, 
I do am, I am a part of a school district that is listening to voices of parents and we do have a process that is evolving as I speak right now. And I'd be happy to share that with you via email once I get done here. Um, overall, these parents have been very patient and have not blasted their grievances on social media as so many parents have done in the past. They are respecting the process and hoping to find um, a resolution that will deliver truth and equality. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Colleen Hamilton to the front. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, grandmother live in Oregon City, and I'm very concerned about some of the things that are and are not happening in many of our schools in Clackamas County. First of all, I want to share, I'm sure hopefully that you've all heard this now, but we have a teacher who is uh, sending announcements on the Google Classroom. You can't, I just want to remind you, sorry, it's, it's Mandy. I'm talking, I know sometimes okay. it's hard to <laughs> yeah. determine who's talking. Please pause her time. I just want to remind you that we're, we're not to talk about, you are not to talk specifically about specific teachers I'm and identify them. I'm not going to mention a name. Trust Thank me. you. If you do, I, I will, will have not. to terminate I your presentation. And I really want to hear what you have to say. Okay. So Thank I appreciate you, you abiding by that. Okay. Right. Yeah. I have no intention of, of spilling the name. I just think that that's a terrible way to uh, contact parents with your biased opinion on what Thank should you. be happening on a survey. Um, I understand that the thin blue line flag has caused a lot of friction here in this school district and I think we maybe better take a look at what we're doing with uh, all of the propaganda items that end up at schools these days and whether it's a thin blue line flag or a uh, uh, farmers, future farmers of America or a pride flag or a Black Lives Matter flag or Oregon State flag and U.S. flag are supposed to be the two flags that are uh, flowing in front of schools. But this survey is very difficult. I mean, I deal with this on an ongoing basis here in Clackamas County. But I will tell you that the 69 pages that are referenced in this survey, for me to be able to support and answer specific questions, is a little over the top. I would assume that this was probably delivered to someone to get out to the parents through the Oregon Department of Education and not just the staff here because it would be quite cumbersome to be able to put all of this together in a matter of a few days to get it out to the parents for a survey. But it talks about uh, the display may not, any display that you approve would not be defamatory, biased, or prejudiced against any individ individual or protected class. Well, who are the protected classes? I'm a grandparent. Am I a protected class if I want to display something? One minute. Or, or who gets p protected? That there's an equity link. There's a freedom of students' expression link. There's a studying controversial issues link. There's a student organization link. More than m one or two pages, many of these. Students' rights and responsibilities. Every student belongs. Non-discrimination. And then we've got the 40-some uh, page supporting gender expansive students. This is a little over the top for anybody to be able to look at in a survey and be able to feel like they can answer it respectfully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite Lisa and Erin Anderson to the front, and Melissa, they'll do three minutes each. Good evening. Hello. Hi. Thank you. I'm Erin Anderson. I'm a parent of the, uh, an Oregon City High School freshman and uh, uh, another a sophomore who goes to a different school district now, largely because of what you've heard tonight and what I'm going to tell you about again some more. Last month I sat here, and for those of you who were uh, in attendance, you'll remember that I uh, explained to you the absolute and indisputable definition of the thin blue line, who we are, 
what that flag stands for and how that definition has been tarnished by the would-be hijackers amongst us. You'll recall that I'm a 33-year police officer and have therefore earned a right to defend the thin blue line and the blue way of life. I can also assure you that no one is more angered by the actions of bad cops than good cops, and fortunately, the latter outnumber the former immeasurably. Sadly, the bad cops are the ones that make the news. Much like an airliner crash, they are few and far between, but tragedy sells headlines and fits into agendas. Last month, I told you about the imaginary blue line between law and order and chaos. I told you that the imaginary line is held by a very real fraction of our society willing to protect their homes and families as well as your homes and families. <clears throat> because together we all represent the good in our society, the part that is worth defending and standing up for. Tonight I'll tell you these firmly held and well-known beliefs come from a background centered on morals and ethics, much of which is derived from the Judeo-Christian principles this country was founded upon. Being moral and ethical is a choice, and for most of us, it becomes as much second nature as breathing. But being a criminal is also a choice. Some in our society draw that breath and don't give it a second thought. That is a direct affront to all that is moral and ethical, and the very reason we have and need the thin blue line. It should go without saying whose morals and ethics, or lack thereof, are most threatened by the thin blue line and those who believe in it. I am not here to be political tonight. I am merely here to stand for the moral and ethical expectation we should all embrace as citizens of our country and stewards of our community. Last week, as you know, the district drafted a policy about displays on school of property the regarding flags, various other sources. Public input was sought via an online survey, and we learned just a few days ago that uh, a teacher whom we cannot name, of course, was uh, uh, distributing information about that survey, and he was informed by a high school administrator that uh, the survey had been largely responded to by conservative parents upset about the removal of the thin blue line flag and that anybody who wanted to defend the LGBTQ flag and symbols like it should also participate in the survey. <clears throat> that teacher's message was uh, signed with a, a rainbow and a fist. My message here tonight is simply that the thin blue line flag stands for all of us in the room who have something to lose at the hands of those who sense that there is something to take. That flag should make us all feels, feel good. It certainly makes my kid and their friends feel good. By its very nature, that flag also stands for tolerance, inclusion, and equality, and equal opportunity for all to be safe, happy, and successful. Is that not how a kid is supposed to feel during the 12 years of his life when our government affords him the opportunity to learn how to think critically Your time is up. and how to be a productive member or of our society? I certainly hope so. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I'm Lisa Anderson. I'm a parent. We've been asking the district for years about what supports are in place for students who have one or both parents in law enforcement. I think it's great that the district is trying to figure out how to show OCPD their support, but what about the students in your schools? How will you show them support? It's certainly not by taking down their flag or by staff discouraging students from voicing their thoughts. Why does the district continue to not support these students? Since taking down the thin blue line flag, my kid feels unsafe, not supported, and unheard. They feel like they're among fellow students and staff who don't respect rules and boundaries. They also feel like they're among people <coughs> pardon me, who don't appreciate police officers. In regards to the survey, a, quote, super important request, end quote, was sent to students from a teacher saying they were told that, quote, so far most of the people who have filled it out are conservative parents who think pride flags should come down if they can't put up the blue line flag. I won't push my opinions on you, but if you support LGBTQ plus rights and recognition, this could be an important place to add your voice, end quote, signed with a rainbow and a fist. If it was mostly non-conservative parents filling out a survey, would staff be sharing the premature results with teachers and students? Why is staff sharing confidential online survey, survey results prematurely with teachers? This is unethical, unprofessional bias, and just plain wrong on so many levels. By the way, I know some non-conservative people who support the thin blue line flag. What about the students who are offended or hate the pride flag? What about the students whose religion goes against what the pride flag represents? Do you take down the flag, that flag without explanation? 
No, it gets shoved down students' throats with no place for hate. But what about the hate One for minute. the thin blue line flag? The hatred, offensiveness, and fear towards the thin blue line flag is unfounded and based on untruths. Why can't we have the opportunity to have a roundtable discussion about this? Why wasn't this opportunity used to teach the truth and real meaning of the thin blue line flag without biased groups and compromised online surveys making all the decisions? My husband and I were told by two staff members that student council voted yes to hang the thin blue line flag up in the commons. Where's the transparency and honesty? If we're really concerned about representing everyone, there are two flags that do exactly that. They're the US flag and the flag of the state of Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Mark and Lori Reeksecker. Please, I hope I said that correctly. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. This is my phone? No. I don't believe it is. There. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Reeksecker. We live in Oregon City. My father graduated Oregon City High School a few years ago, and Lori's son graduated Oregon City as well. Between my business and my residence over the years, my wife and I have paid in hundreds of thousands of dollars in property taxes to the schools. What have we gotten in return for our hard-earned money? A top-notch education for the children? I don't believe so. Oregon City ranks 21st in, in Oregon the high school that is, and the U.S. ranks 18th in the world. Number one should be the goal on both accounts. Instead, we hear that some children identify as cats, that teachers must meow to them and provide a litter box, and the staff must pander to this nonsense or get reprimanded or fired. Let's look at the school district policies. Code JB, Equal Educational Opportunity. Every student of the district will be given equal educational opportunity regardless of age, sex, sexual orientation, gender, identity, race, religion, color, national origin, disability, marital status, familial status, parental status, linguistic background, cultural, socioeconomic status, capability, or geographic location. Nowhere does it include dogs, cats, or any other domestic animal. Code JB uses the, the term student, so let's define what a student is. One, it's one who, can tr who is enrolled or attends classes at school. Number two, one who studies something. We have a cat at home, and she is not enrolled or attends classes, and definitely doesn't study. I put a written test in front of her, she looked at it, and went back to sleep. I mention this to illustrate the fact that can't, cats are not students. Code JFCA, student dress and, and grooming. The board recognizes that school dress significantly influences student behavior and that appropriate dress and grooming contribute to a productive One learning minute. environment as well as promote individual dignity. At the end of the paragraph it says, not to cause a disruption to the educational process or interference with the classroom learning environment. Dressing or acting as a cat does not promote the dignity of the student and disrupts the educational process and classroom learning environment. Code JFC, Student Conduct and Discipline. The board expects students' conduct to contribute to a productive learning climate. Students shall comply with the district's policies, admi administrative regulation, and conduct themselves in an orderly manner during the school day. All staff members have responsibility for consistency in establishing and maintaining an appropriate behavioral atmosphere. Students shall be subject to discipline, suspension, or expulsion as per Oregon Revised Statute 339.250 for misconduct, including but not limited to... Your time is up. Okay. I'm going to yield my time to him so he can finish. Thank you. Please continue. The statute for misconduct, including but not limited to, number 11, because I'm skipping a bunch, disruption of the school environment, number 12, Open defiance of a teacher's authority, including failure to comply with a lawful direction of a teacher's or school officials. 
We see the staff are required to maintain an appropriate behavioral atmosphere. Is pretending to be a cat normal and appropriate behavior for a human? Code JEA, compulsory attendance. All children between the ages of 6 and 18 who have not completed the 12th grade are required to regularly attend a public school. Let's examine the internet definition of children or child. One, a young person, especially between infancy and puberty. Two, a son or daughter of human parents. So, by the Oregon City Board policies that children are required to attend school, and the defini definition of children does not include cats or any other domestic pet, any child that identifies as a cat should be given two options. Behave and act as a child and conform to normal public behavior while at school or identify as a cat or any other desired domestic pet and stay home. Since by the policy stated above, cats and domestic pets, pets are not required nor allowed to go to public schools. Thank you. Thank you. That is the final speaker for this evening. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to the next item, 2023-24 Clackamas Education Service District Local Service Plan. Larry Didway is joining us this evening. Good evening. I believe others may be joining you, but yes. they're not on my agenda. So if they could introduce themselves, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, Holly. Yeah. All right, Chair Phil Pott, uh, thank you for having us here tonight, board members. Uh, I'm glad to be here, uh, Larry Didway, and I get to be superintendent for Clackamas ESD. And with me here tonight are two board members of the Clackamas ESD, and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm Susan Trone. Thank you. And I'm Linda Brown. Thank you for being here both. Yeah. And we, we are here tonight uh, to talk with you about the 23 24. Uh, local service plan for Clackamas ESD. That's our plan for providing services to all 10 of the component school districts in Clackamas County. And uh, before we dive into that though, I want to share a few really heartfelt thank yous. Uh, the first of which I want to direct to your superintendent, Dale Spitzer. Uh, Dr. Spitzer is a wonderful addition to our regional superintendents group that meets regularly and collaborates um, sharing information and addressing challenges. And of course, we've had a few of those over the last couple of years. Um, and we're really pleased to have her a part of our group. We appreciate her insights and her expertise. And, um, and, and I'm really glad to have her as a new partner. I also want to call out the entire business office team. And we really uh, want, want to say what a great group of colleagues. They are bringing energy to their work. And we deeply appreciate their partnership with us. Uh, we also want to call out on pages 10 and 11 of your local service plan. There are a list of the other advisory groups that the Clackamas ESD facilitates. These are professionals who come together and regularly meet with their regional colleagues and advisory groups. And their commitment to this collaborative work has very, been very, very uh, critical to, to the work that we have accomplished. I also want to mention that uh, while we're a little late, we do want to recognize January Board Appreciation Month and say thank you to each and every one of you um, who are serving on the school board. We know that that requires a great deal of dedication and personal sacrifice, and we really value what you bring in terms of your volunteer at your uh, commitment. And, and we also want to say thank you uh, for your for um, making a difference for the, all of the kids in our community and promoting public education, not just in January, but all year long. We also uh, wanted to give our thanks by presenting you with a set of note cards that feature student work from our 2022 Clackamas ESD Regional Art Show. And I heard you tell Mr. Martin that he needed a place to uh, display his work and I will tell you that we just opened up the 2023 uh, art show uh, application so I'll let him know. <laughs> um, 
I also want to invite uh, an extended invitation for any member of your board to serve on the Clackamas ESD Budget Committee, which meets in May every year to review and approve our annual budget. And we have board members from several other of the component school districts in, in on this committee, and we would love to have participation from Oregon City. So if you're interested, uh, please let Dr. Spitzer know or contact me. So a few things about the documents that we brought for you. Uh, there's a local service plan, and we're going to ask you to take that into consideration and approve that tonight. Uh, this is uh, a plan that's made annually. It, it is required by the state of Oregon, and it covers the very specific areas. Uh, the other two documents are just for your information, but I'll talk about each of those a little bit as well. For the 23-24 Clackamas Education Service District Local Service Plan, it does begin with advice and um, contributions from each of our advisory groups that uh, help us shape that plan for the coming year. And it reflects a productive partnership between the ESD and all 10 of the school districts that we serve. It covers the comprehensive services in resolution services. Those are those services that are available to every single and provided to every single school district. They cover the areas of special education, technology and data, teaching and learning supports, as well as direct re district revenue that comes to you to apply to ESD services of your choice. Then we have the area of contracts and grant services. Those are areas that districts can opt into, and those cover many areas like early learning, special education, technology, and teaching and learning support, uh, as well as grants, and those can be federal, state, and or private sources. And an example of those would be the multiple student support services that we provide through Dick district technical support services um, and through the Student Success Act funding. The LSP, the Local Service Plan, has been approved by our Clackamas Chief Administrators Council. That's a group comprised of all 10 Clackamas County School District Superintendents and the President of Clackamas Community College. And it has also been approved by the Clackamas CSD Board of Directors. And we bring it here to you tonight uh, for your approval. The other uh, documents we have in front of you are uh, the Oregon City School District 21-22 Fiscal Year Review. And that document uh, should be in your paper packet. And we also provided a copy of each of the other nine school districts so that you would have those for your reference as well. But I'll highlight just a little bit uh, from Oregon City. There was nearly $6.9 million in total services that were provided, and that's an increase of about $1.1 million from the prior year. And there was more than $1.4 million in revenue that was funneled directly to you, and that was up for about $200,000 from the prior year. And we have vibrant par partnerships here in Oregon City uh, to improve STEM learning opportunities, supporting multilingual learners, providing early learning evaluation and support services, providing special education services to students with very complex needs, supporting school nurses and counselors, helping address student mental health needs, providing a range of data and technology support, and supporting improvements to curriculum and instruction. We hope the format of that form or that report is helpful to you. And if you have any feedback or would like to see that arranged any differently, we'd love to hear from you. And then the other and last document I'll share is our annual report that has the title All Rise. And that is just a report that we produce annually uh, for you to be able to share the impact of Clackamas ESD in our region through data and stories and um, smaller nuggets of information that we wanted to make uh, available to you. And we hope that that is also useful to you and we would welcome your feedback on that as well. And with that, I'll pause and see if you have any questions or comments. Can I make a quick comment? Yes, please. So several years ago, my husband served on the Oregon City School Board, and I had been uh, on the ESD board for a little while, I don't know, maybe four or five years, and uh, I recruited him to come and serve on the budget committee, <laughs> and it was, he was so glad that he did it. So I hope you'll consider sending someone, because he certainly came back from that one meeting, it's like one evening for a few hours, 
really amazed by all the things that the ESD does for school districts. So anyway, just a little extra plug. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Throughout the years, the ESD has made an incredible impact on our district and the other districts, given the rise in some of the disability services that are being requested, the mental health needs of our students who are attending, the families um, supporting them with smaller children who have yet to enter the school district. The work you do makes such an impact and we are very grateful to partner together. We appreciate the partnership as well. Thank you. I had the opportunity to tour actually three of the um, LEAP classrooms in Oregon City last week and what I observed there was the opportunity for children with very complex needs to have interaction, um, meaningful connection with each other and with the adults in that room, opportunity to paint, opportunity to express through a number of different ways that they might not have. Otherwise had that opportunity when I think how different that is even 50 years ago for how children with complex needs um, would uh, would not have those opportunities. So I'm I'm even more moved by what the ESD does this year after visiting those classrooms. So yay! Thank you for all you give to Oregon City. And I, I might, yeah, I, I might point out we we appreciate the space being available at Oregon City High School too because that that those classrooms do serve students from all over the region. Yeah. I also want to voice some appreciation and support. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight and presenting, first of all. But the work you do, I agree, is extraordinarily essential to our systems at the local level. Um, so special education was already mentioned. That's certainly one to highlight first. Anna, thank you for bringing up early childhood and early intervention because we don't have public preschool in Oregon anywhere. And I think any developmental specialist would tell you that a child that has special needs, that those early years are so critical that they can receive therapies and assessments mm -hmm. and special education support at their preschool if they're able to go to one, if they, their family can afford that, for example. But either way, we have those supports in homes and in schools, and that's so critical. And then our special education department, I'm sure, could put it more eloquently than I can, what difference that makes once they get to kindergarten. And then you have support for our SPED in K through 12 as well, and also critical and essential. I also wanted to point out that I think a theme as I read through these each year is not only helping our staff with the impossibly heavily lift that they have, but also support for them professionally and offering community for them that connects across school districts. Mm -hmm. For example, for counselors, for school nurses, these positions are really spread thin. Mm -hmm. And you have support for them to help them along and that might help us keep them and help them do their jobs better without, frankly, the, the risk of burnout with how much work they do. That also applies to tech. We've heard from our, our, our tech uh, uh, staff how spread thin they are. Mm -hmm. and. I wish there was more with our budget we could do to help them, but without your support and your services, again, I don't see it, it all working. <laughs> so thank you. I can't say enough, but that's what came to mind first. Yeah. Thank you. And convening is one of our, our key roles, for sure. Uh, bo both uh, cross-district professional groups and support, but also community convening. And one of those um, things that I would encourage you to check out um, is Child Care for All, which is a group in Clackamas County that is uh, looking at the needs through a whole needs ho holistic needs assessment and, and then plans for making um, progress on uh, addressing the, the short the shortfall of child care available in Clackamas County and Clackamas ESD is hosting that with Clackamas Workforce Partnership and with the Early Learning Hub. Awesome. And, been, there, and there's been a group that's been working on that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. We appreciate Thanks it. Thanks very much. It's nice to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, next item, financial audit summary, Kyle Janicki. Hi, members of the board.
board. Appreciate we uh, have come. Can you hear me? Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. Is that better? <coughs> can you hear him? Oh. Kyle, can we test your sound? Can you speak for a moment? Hello? How's it going? Uh, I can talk louder. Does that help? Oh, it's getting better. Oh, that's as loud as I can. Is that better? Yeah, uh, it's better. Okay, give me a second. My mic's all the way turned up. So I'll be sure to talk as loud as I can. Um, let me know if you need me to talk a bit louder. Um, so I'm here to present the audit report uh, here being remote. I appreciate you letting us do this remotely. Um, you guys should have received as part of your board packet the management letter related, not management letter, governing body letter related to the audit. It goes over the purpose of our audit, the responsibilities of the auditing <coughs> firm, as well as our planning, and then most importantly, our results. Uh, the results of the audit uh, is an un un unmodified opinion which basically means a clean opinion in relation to the financial statement audit. In regards to the statement, uh, statement standards portion of our audit, we did find an exception. Uh, it's listed on page 129 of the report. I believe it is a budget over expenditure as explained in the body of the report itself. Um, for our federal awards audit, uh, colloquially uh, referred to as a single audit, we found no issues of non-compliance and no question costs. And as a result, we have not issued a management letter. Uh, the next um, item that we'd like to discuss is significant audit matters. A big implementation came into effect this year, uh, GASB Statement 87 in regards to leases. The district did implement this standard, which is a big undertaking and they did, it was, took a lot of work and it was very well done by the district. Um, moving along, we do have some announcements. When I say moving along, I'm going to jump to other matters. And uh, in other matters, we do go over the new GASB standards. And a big GASB standard that is coming out uh, for the next fiscal audit, which is currently in effect this fiscal year, um, is GASB 96 in relation to subscription-based information technology agreements, which is really very similar to GASB 87. It takes a lot of accounting. Uh, it's a lot of calculations, especially for a first year of implementation, it does create a lot of extra work on and burden on a finance office. Um, those were the highlights of the report. I didn't know if you had any specific questions at this time. It's Kyle, right? Kyle, um, yeah. this is, sorry, this is Board Chair Mandy Philpott. Um, there was a reference in, so what, what I received as a board member is the letter. There was a reference in the letter about page 129 of the report that you had indicated was an exception noted in the report. Um, we didn't have access to page 129. Can you explain to me what the exception is and whether or not we were in compliance or out of compliance and what the recommendations may be if we were not in compliance. So there's multiple facets of our audit. One is the financial statement audit, which is the opinion based. The next big one is the federal awards, which had no, uh, um, no issues of compliance or non-compliance and no question costs. State minimum standards, as the state of Oregon requires us to uh, test and review certain aspects of Oregon law, Oregon regulations to ensure that um, municipalities are acting in accordance with the laws. Um, as part of our audit, we look for this specific instance, it is related to the budget. Um, there was a budget over expenditure, and that is a case where what was budgeted, um, items were exceeded expenditure wise, and instead of, so any instance of that occurring, we have to know. It doesn't affect audit opinion, it doesn't affect federal audit opinion, it only affects our organ minimum standards or, uh, or, uh, or SOAR sort of testing related to audit requirements in the state of court. The specific cause, um, Doug may be able to provide a bit more detailed information on what specifically caused that. However, it doesn't affect our overall audit opinion itself. We just have to state any time that 
something is, as in if you're over a dollar, we have to technically announce it. The exact dollar figure would be in the report itself. Okay, but despite that, we, your overall opinion is that we're in compliance. Correct, in compliance and a clean, in compliance with federal standards as well as a clean opinion, unmodified opinion, which is the best opinion you could get for your financial statement. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I hear no other questions. Thank you very much, Kyle, for being here. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Kyle. You guys have a good day. Thank, good thank you. I also uh, wanted to introduce to you Matt Deeds. He's our accounting supervisor. He did a ton of work on this financial report, and he was congratulated by Kyle, <coughs> called out actually as one of very few within the entire state that was able to complete both GASB 86 and 87 calculations without the use of a private contractor. So we are grateful for Impressive. your service. Matt. Yes. Impressive. Thank you, Mr. Deeds. All right, uh, next up, facilities, grounds, responsibilities, and schedule, Tom Larson. Mr. Larson here. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Oh, and Mr. Sweeten is also joining you, unless he's gonna help you with your chair. <laughs> Hello, y'all. Hello. Uh, it's the first time I've met you. I'm Welcome. new to this position in uh, so it's, it's nice meeting you. I thought I'd start with getting a little personal so that you know <laughs> who I am and just give you a little, you know, I'm just an everyday Joe and then we'll jump into the, the fun stuff. Um, I'm happy to be here as part of the Oregon City School District uh, family. Um, a little bit about myself. I've, I came from a neighboring school district. Um, before that, I ran my own construction business doing residential remodel. Uh, I am married. My wife and I have been together for 38 years. Um, married for 32 of those, but we go clear back to elementary school. So <laughs> we've been together a long time. Um, and I'm going to do a plug because I'm sure she's watching. Uh, happy Valentine's Day, even though it's a day early. So. <laughs> and that's why we've been married so long. So <laughs> um, I have two sons, um, both graduated um, Oregon City High School, uh, one in 2014, one in 2018. Um, and I have a, a daughter-in-law that's fairly new within the last year and a half. Um, one of my sons is a shop supervisor at a local forklift company. Um, my other son is a paramedic for AMR and actually works Clackamas County. So I told some of my staff, if you ever have the opportunity to meet him, he's a really nice guy, but you're probably having a bad day. So, <laughs> so but he, he will take care of you. Uh, and his wife, um, my daughter-in-law, is a school teacher in a neighboring school district, a uh, second grade teacher. Um, so I'm very proud of all of them. Uh, last but not least, I have two dachshunds, um, Ace and Snoop. They're 15 years old. They've been around a long time. Uh, and then I've got two grand dogs. Um, they're both pugs. And uh, that's Lola and Coco. So um, what I like to do on my spare time is I just love working in my yard. And I'm into hot rods and currently, unfortunately, having to rebuild the engine on mine to get ready for those car shows this summer. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm just an everyday Joe that's living life. So... So I currently am working with six ground crew members. Um, and one of those crew members is dedicated full time to the high school. Um, these guys are amazing. They are out in the rain, shine, hot, cold. Even when I try to bring them in due to unworkable weather conditions, they still would rather be out there getting things done. They are awesome. Um, they get so into their work just the other day. I wish I would have had a camera. One of my guys came in and Thank God he had safety glasses on because he was literally from head to toe covered in uh, the splatter that comes off a weed trimmer. So it was just, I've never seen anything like that. So <laughs> he's really into it. Um, so I'd like to give a shout out to them um, for everything they do. They are all very amazing. So. 
All right, so those six guys and Tom being their supervisor, um, you probably have seen this before, right? Because this is from the bond, right? There, I did update though over there, built in 2021 for a gardener. Um, so those are our school facilities, but we also have additional facilities, Barkley, Pioneer Stadium, Admin Office, Park Place, um, Eastham, transportation facilities, all of those equal more than 300 acres of land to maintain, um, so year round, right? So during those ice storms, during the summer, during the spring, when we're all mowing every week, uh, they're doing that too, uh, but that's what they love to do. So um, just kind of giving everyone kind of a perspective of what those five guys go out and do. So uh, some of their responsibilities, um, they do all the typical ground responsibilities. They mow, pick up leaves, storm cleanup, trimming trees and uh, shrubs, maintaining bioswells, storm drains, fence repairs, and painting field lines. Um, and they don't stop there. Um, some of you may not know that they actually, they, they're furniture movers when we have staff moving from building to building. Uh, they're moving the programs from site to site. Um, curriculum pickup and deliveries, um, which includes tons of recycling and right now uh, lots of books and things. It seems to be a hot topic is books. Um, um, uh, and they also do uh, painting of the exterior buildings um, and uh, the parking lot lines. So they're not just in the, the green stuff. They're all over the district doing all sorts of fun things. Um, and they always just jump in and are willing to help whenever there's a need. Um, so again, it's just a shout out to those guys. Coming in new f to these gentlemen, um, we've got some plans. So moving forward as our team grows together, uh, my plan includes some of these, some trainings. Um, we got irrigation, operation, and repair. Uh, we currently are in the process of training a few of the team on our baseline system, uh, which is our automated irrigation program. Uh, this will be an ongoing training um, as new technology comes up and so forth. We also rely on contractors to help us out when in need. Uh, spray licenses. Um, we are looking at acquiring a spray license. Um, this is for pesticide sprays uh, for chemicals, which help in weed control and such. At your homes, you can spray Roundup and things like that, but as a public entity, um, we have to be licensed post signage um, and have knowledge of the chemical that is used um, and we're limited on what we can use. Um, so at this time we are relying on contractors to help us out with that need. Uh, proper use of equipment. Just last week um, I attended a chainsaw class with my team. Um, it was very informative and safety minded as well as a great time to bond with them. So it was, it's really nice getting to know those guys. Um, following safety protocols like eye and ear protection, uh, we're looking into high-vis vests um, so they can be seen when they're out in the fields and in the parking lots and, and keep them safe as well as others that may walk up on them. If they don't hear things moving, then at least they might see them. Uh, so we're, I'm in the process of trying to assess our need for their fleet and the equipment that they use and efficiencies. Um, this whole slide is really about assessing our equipment and trainings so that we can have what we need to be successful and efficient. Um, we need to be as efficient as possible based on the size of our crew versus the large area that uh, those six guys take care of. So we're just moving forward with all that. Field management and plans. So we're digging deeper into this. This is something I'm going to start working with um, with the district. Um, but some of the information I've gathered from my staff is they, you know, my first season here. So they're they're mowing fields twice a week. Um, we try our best to achieve this, but weather definitely plays a factor at what equipment can go out onto those fields. Because if it's too wet, then the tractors and mowers are going to damage some of those fields. Um, Pre-grooming infields, like in the softball and baseball fields, 
pre-grooming some of that will, if we, if the soil gets loosened up, it'll help with weeds not taking hold. Uh, weeds like to get, if the soil is nice and tight, there's uh, no, no air or water getting to them, then the soil's not in nutrient, you know, it doesn't have enough nutrients in it, so the weeds love that and they'll just, they love the compacted soil. Uh, fields, facilities will work directly with contact, contractors to maintain and service irrigation systems. As mentioned before, we are in training so that we can learn more about the work on the controlling of the irrigation and learn more about that and have more people as backups on that. Um, so we have that covered. Um, pest controls. Um, examples, moles, uh, communication when they appear. We're, we're hoping to work with staff in the future. So if moles, well moles are attracted by grubs and worms and so forth. They really don't like vibrations, but the vibrations of rain and people and equipment brings all that stuff to the surface, which brings the moles to the surface and because they just like to feast on that. Um, so we want to start working so that um, if something should appear like a mole hole or something like that, as soon as something shows up, have the site alert so that we can communicate, you know, so that site can communicate with facilities and maintenance so we can get a work order going and get out there and get that taken care of right away. And then last but not least, again, it's the weather. Um, let's hope we have a great uh, spring because last year was not very good. It was a pretty wet spring and it made it pretty terrible because the district I did come from, it was pretty challenging there. So I could imagine it had to been about the same here because we just couldn't get our head above water literally so. <laughs> so one of our last slides obviously uh, communication is uh, one of our goals so as Tom's coming in assessing all of our fields our facilities because he has two teams right one of them is our grounds crew but our others is our facilities um, we're working with the schools right so the schools um, we met with the high school re recently their athletic department um, to figure out a better way to communicate and how that works. And so um, one of the things we realized is uh, they didn't have access to see our work order system. Um, it was done by the high school overall and not the athletic department. So just recently we reached out to them and that was a request of theirs. And so um, Tom worked with Mary and Mary was able to get them, get them a different way to access that. That way that they can see the progress. Um, so like moles, uh, although it's going through that system, it would be an outside contractor, right, that's coming in to deal with those and then put down flags and hopefully kids don't take the flags and when they come back to get their traps. Um, so just all of those things. So we know there's a lot to do and uh, obviously you heard earlier that there's uh, improvements to be made and we really want to make those partnerships and so communication we think is key for that and so we definitely want to um, make that better and Tom being in he's fairly new uh, he's doing a great job of just trying to figure out where everything is and his team and uh, he's got a lot of great ideas that he can uh, implement um, for our district so we're looking forward to that. All right, that's what we have. Do you have any questions for us? Yeah, I got some questions. All right, <laughs> we might get some answers. All right, uh, 300 acres, six guys, that's 50 acres a piece. Do we have enough bandwidth to maintain it properly? You were coming up on a budget season, and would you, I mean, you're, it sounds like you're newer to this, but that's a lot of work for six guys to maintain in our district. Um, so I've, work. And the buildings and and, and and you're over facilities with the maintenance and the grounds. You're not just grounds, correct? Correct. Okay, got it. Correct. And yes. So it but we're talking so grounds are we're, dedicated. We're just talking six. grounds just right now. And so from what I understand in uh, the guys over there, some of them in the summer may jump on a tractor. Um, so we may get extra mowing in the summer when it comes to fields because you just get on there, beautiful sunny day, you get after it. Um, so there is some cross there, but we also have to take care of the buildings. Mm -hmm. So to get to answer that question, I'm not 100% sure how we're, you know, how that's all going to really work out because it's, I've got to live at 
through your world mm -hmm. to understand it first. So it, I'm going to do my best to just be in front of it and see what's happening. And working with the staff, I think, is going to is going to help me do that. Um, I've gotten a lot of input from them. Um, we're, we haven't quite got there yet, but we're starting. Uh, if I can get them all together, there's always somebody, you know, off sick, and it's just that time of year with holidays. We're going to start doing the weekly meetings, and then that way, I can build a better team with the grounds side of things, really understand where they're going, and and find the, the actual need that where are we, you know, where are we lacking, and what, you know, we can do to, you know, help with that. Um, because yeah, with you got formals and everything, you know, I'm trying to get them all set up so they have everything they need. So if, if a guy leaves, he's got everything on his trailer ready to go, um, and have that. I mean, that's kind of one of the visions. Um, so it's it's really a tough for me to answer this because I haven't lived here for a spring or summer yet. So um, since I've been here, we've been picking up leaves and chasing storms. So it's yeah. <laughs> it's. So it's it's tough. So I'm sorry I can't. Now I'm just sparking, getting you thinking here. Um, uh, uh, the work order process. Michael mentioned it a little bit. Um, just off the top of your head, how m do you know like what the backlog is right now? I do not. I can find out and get back to you. Yeah. So they're not sectioned out by grounds versus just facilities. The, it's all compiled in one. Mm -hmm. And I know, in as some communities listening right now. Um, I know from because I'm in construction and there's somebody's emergency is not the district's emergency. It's fire life and safety is probably priority, and then and then there's a tier system that goes down. So how do we communicate that? I think with the community when they have a complaint that we appreciate it and get to it, but we have X, Y, and Z that's fire. You know, some sort of a safety issue that should be priority which could jump ahead in the line. And if I think there was quite a few work orders answer, uh, service last year in the thousands. Mm -hmm. I, I think when we talked last, last year about this. Mm -hmm. So I think the kind of the process, people knowing it, it is, is helpful because um, somebody has a concern, maybe a trip hazard or something, and um, it, might, it might get addressed quicker than some, you know, something else that maybe fall maintenance for a specific field or something that's a good question so yeah so sometimes we fall into just life fire safety mm -hmm. and we that's all we can do right and so we were there we were shorter on staff last year and we were kind of in that boat we're fully staffed now uh, well until next week <laughs> we just uh, we're losing a grounds person which will be posted so if anybody's <laughs> interested uh, just put a plug in uh, but yes, and so if you're ever concerned about your school building, um, so basically the site manager is your principal. So if they're the ones that approve all the work orders as they go through. So someone's designated, say a secretary, to put those in. And then uh, the principal always has to approve them first before they even go to the facilities. And so if you're ever wondering like, oh goodness, that you know window was broken, did, the, did you guys know about that? They can say oh yeah we put that in you know it's that windows from 1952 and then we got to get a contractor for that specific window or you know they're coming out right away they're going to board it up until we can get one that type of thing they can talk about the progress um, but yeah so if there's specific questions you have like that the buildings will know and so they try and update those in there where they are in the process you know Mary Coney works really hard on that to, to do that and if if it's not in there then the secretary could call her as well or Tom mm -hmm. ground squirrels I think we got a bunch at the high school not just moles but I was gonna point that out those little guys make some pretty good holes out there um, who takes fields the um, maintenance request because there's not a, for the stadium like how would the what would be the process if I'm down there and doing something would it the athletic Senior. director mm -hmm. or is it the yeah okay. so athletic department so you could either shoot that off to uh, should I say names <laughs> Joan uh, Joan. Uh, Joan or Cindy and then okay. so that's how we change that um, because yeah it was all just going to the big high school in just one big format yeah so it was all just listed so if it was an HVAC unit 
in the hallway that's a, that was in the same list as you know a field or sports and so then trying to figure out where those were because there's a lot of them I mean that's a very it's a huge um, campus you know you've got over 2,000 people there and so just the facility alone let alone the stadium let alone the grounds right so all of those things um, having those work orders so we're hoping that that will make it easier and Cindy asked for that she said you know I asked to put it in it's probably in I can't see it I don't know where it's at so if someone asked me I can't tell so this way she'll be able to look at those and she's familiar with that um, as being a, uh, an old not an old uh, experience uh, <laughs> principal that's what it is. I'm the old principal yeah so I know I'm asking a lot of questions. We just got two beautiful brand new turf fields that will need maintenance. And we have one, a, a gorgeous field down here. What do we have? I know there's, we bring a contract company in, but would there be some thought of uh, purchasing our own equipment to, to fluff and, and get the stuff out of there as, as we're for as you're new and thinking of I new think things to do? I think there might be some equipment. I, I was looking around and there's some equipment. I'm not that familiar with you know fluffing the turf and all that and what equipment but i have found some equipment that i believe is all turf uh for turf service and my hope is that um unfortunately we did just lose a ground person but my hope is hopefully we can get somebody in there that knows more about turf that would really help pick up that need because um, yeah. i see where we need have the need for you know that and so somebody that's familiar with turf would really be helpful because with Gardner and, and you, we just keep adding turf, so we need to take care of that. Yeah, the the longevity of it lasts longer, and I know maybe mm -hmm. we, we train for boilers and stuff, maybe the district could train for a turf tech as well. Yeah, so each year, well, prior to this year, and their new turf this year, but it, it is fluffed, it's sanitized, mm -hmm. and then it's G-Max tested, it which is uh, really important because you want to know the impact, right, over, as it's wearing through the years. So. Um, that's paid through risk management. And so an outside company comes in and does the GMAX. And right now they're doing the sanitation and the fluffing as well, but hopefully we'll be able to bring that in now. So, yeah. Are you done? Oh, I could be oh, here all day. Question. Maybe we'll just go get coffee someday. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm very excited that you're here, Tom. And I'm excited about what you're talking about, which sounds to me like a streamlined and uniform, predictable process for how things get done. Um, and, you. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's, I that's what, and, and I know, right uh, well, <laughs> I know that you're new and you're saying to me that, and us that you're new and you don't know the answers. And that's also kind of refreshing too, because I just want someone to tell me what they know and what they don't know. <laughs> Because then I believe that they can start making a plan for fixing things. You know, you kind of have to deconstruct to reconstruct. Um, I just made that up, by the way. I like it. Um, but but I kind of feel like um, there was there's there's no existing and streamlined, understood, uniform process. And if if there is a contribution to be made. I perceive in your position it's doing something like that and and that may take a while but what I'm hearing you saying that you're working on I think um, it is going to be a, a huge improvement to what we have now and I appreciate that um, <clears throat> I think that there are a lot of individuals in the community who are willing to help with certain projects um, and so you know it eventually or is there an opportunity to partner with some of these groups some of these booster groups um, to to help and not hinder your process but to help your process um, and maybe you don't have the answer for that now but perhaps that's something that you incorporate as you go down the road um, do you have thoughts on that I, I leave as we grow together and I learn processes in the Oregon City School District it'll help me figure that part out um, I think that's all part of the 
the big plan of trying to work together because if we're working together, it's certainly going to make things better and easier. It'll be less stress for me as well because we're all just, if we can get it streamlined, um, like you said, you, we kind of have a chance right now to reset a little bit, maybe try some new things and see if we can, if we can, um, you know, get a good team going all the way around. Yeah. Thank our, you. Yeah, our hope is to work more closely with the athletic department in the high school um, because then we know what those needs are. And so we've met with Cindy Borgmeyer and just trying to get that, especially with the boosters, right? Because you have different boosters for different sports right now. Uh -huh. um, and everyone has really good intentions, right? And so when we go to, uh, as boosters, when we go to get something, whether you're a PTA, whether you're boosters, those are very similar things, right? And you're buying things for uh, facilities, it's a, it's a different thing, right? Because we're a commercial kind of establishment. We're, we have the public, it has to also last over time. We have a lot of risk involved. We have kids climbing all over things, things like that, right? So they have to withstand that. So we really want to partner with them so that if they're purchasing something, we see the specs, we know how that installation is going to go in. Is it going to be our contractor? Hopefully it's the contractor that comes with that product. Um, all of those things are really important. Um, even though we want to contribute, sometimes there's a lot more that you need for that contribution. And so we think that hopefully partnering more with the athletic department so that we can say, you know, oh, we want this new, you know, whatever it is, then, oh, we also have to prepare the land for that, or we have to install that with concrete, all of those things that sometimes, me personally not being a contractor, um, but contractors know, right? So you have to sometimes prepare that land, even if it's just something simple like bleachers, you just buy them, you set them down, it doesn't quite work like that. It's gotta be a super flat space, it's gotta be prepped land, so it's gonna stay there. Mm -hmm. um, so just even those little things. So hopefully we, we can have the more ongoing meetings um, with that athletic department so we can get an idea mm -hmm. of what those things are they want and they're going towards so that we're ready for that. Um, and then we can talk through what, what needs to be on our end. Either, either we're doing it or another contractor is doing it. Either way, we mm -hmm. still need to know. Just like the bond, those buildings were built with outside contractors, all of those documents then go back to facilities because then if something's leaking, Tom has to look it up in those blueprints, go in there and figure out what possibly could be in that wall. Yeah. Right? So we, we still have to know all of those things because although we as parents can be, you know, really great intentions, right? If my kid is in eighth grade today and I bought that thing at that school and then I moved on, us as a district now have inherited that. And so, and we want it to be the best for all those generations of kids. And so there's a lot to it. And yeah. So we don't want and, to stop them. And I think that's why I'm so excited about this building this communication piece, because I think that there are groups that weren't getting any communication back. And that was really frustrating, right? Um, so I, I'm excited. I'm, ve I'm very excited for what you're intending to do. I think it's going to make a huge difference, and I appreciate it. Thank you. I look forward to it. Any other questions or comments? Welcome to Thank you. Thank yes. You. Thank, Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for being Very here. Thank you. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, ELD adoption update. Rob Robinson. It's actually going to be me because unfortunately, oh. Mr. Welcome. Robinson is sick. Oh. So I told him I'd be happy to give the update on his behalf. Thank you. Um, this should be quick. This is a program update for our curriculum adoption for our English language development curriculum. You may recall um, we did decide as a board that we would postpone this adoption to this year to make it after our language arts adoption so that we could see how it would partner. And they've been going through that process under um, Rob's leadership. So. Um, Couple things to know, uh, I'm pretty sure you know the why, but just so our public's informed, we have multilingual students that qualify um, that are entitled to this support, and this supports in addition to their core language arts um, curriculum. Um, and this is until they become proficient in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. 
So those services come alongside for these kids. What we're looking for in the adoption process are materials um, that are going to be the best possible resource for all students. And this is K-12. And they are also resources used in our dual language classes. Um, what we decide to review is really based on the recommendations of programs that go through the Oregon Department of Education, also materials used in our uh, districts around us, and new versions of our current programs. Just a reminder that we do not have to adopt something that's been approved by ODE for curriculum. Um, however, we do have to go through an independent adoption process if we choose to go uh, with something that has not been through their process. So we're not quite there yet, but just letting you know we're looking at a variety of options. This is our landing page. I'd be happy to share this with you. We use something similar in our language arts adoption and I was like, Rob, this worked well for us. Can we do this again? So this is just a one pager that has all the guiding documents, all of the slides for every single meeting that we have, um, all of the standards, all of the rubrics we're using, links, hot links to all the materials. So if anyone's interested in seeing that as we go through this process, we'd be happy to share that with you. Most importantly, we want to make sure you're really aware of the timeline for this adoption. We're right in review right now. I was very lucky to sit in with them um, last week as they were looking at uh, the different programs that were available. They've met twice so far. They've uh, done some agreement on rubrics that they're going to be using. Some of those come right from the state. And they're doing great alike collaboration. So they're talking to other EL specialists from across the district in different schools. So two programs will be selected from each grade band, grade, grade band, excuse me, and from those two finalists, we're going to ask the publishers to come in to present to us. They often show us kind of the whole scope and sequence, correct. And then after that, there will be for those two programs a public viewing and recommendation process. So they'll be made available to our parents. Um, we, we always aim for at least a week to 10 days in two public Oregon City locations. We are very attentive to the idea that something's available after hours. So if parents want to go and look at it after work, that it's available. Our library partnered with us last time and that was wonderful. So we'll do something similar. And then um, that team will come forward with a recommendation um, to all of you for purchase in April or May so that we can get those materials. This is not nearly on the scope of the language arts adoption. Um, it's a smaller cost. It's a smaller breadth of materials. Um, but it is for a very specific purpose. So as we move forward with the recommendation, um, um, we will kind of keep you apprised of where we're at. Any questions for me? No. Thank okay. you for filling in. Thank you for the information. It's my Appreciate pleasure. It. Okay, next up, uh, Integrated Guidance, Education, Innovation, and Improvement Grant. Dr. Deboy again. This won't be as fast, but I am <laughs> going to try my best to be very clear. <laughs> And know that we are all here, and I am always here for your questions if you want to send any tor towards uh, me at any time. So this is really about um, our improvement plan and integrated grants application that will be due at the end of March. And I want to give you all the foundation so that when we get to the March board meeting and we present you with our plan, you understand kind of the process and what's led up to this to this point. A little bit of background. Um, this effort to integrate many initiatives actually came from the state and many educational leaders. You may recall, as I've presented to you many times, that our different grants all have different timelines, different reporting processes, different platforms on which to report. Um, everything was different for every one of them and it, it makes it very, very challenging um, to be sure that you're really um, staying on top of it and of course I will stay awake at night if I feel like we're somehow off. So if it has been a big effort to keep all of those things in line. So this is ODE saying, we're going to take some of these and combine those together and recognize that there are combined processes for community engagement and needs assessment and planning and budgeting and evaluation that really fit for a number of these things that could be integrated and braided together. So this is supposed to reduce burden and redundancies which I'm very excited about, and really improve our framework so that we have common um, focuses. There are four common goals for all of these initiatives identified by ODE, and they are well-rounded education, equity advanced, engaged community, and strengthened systems and capacity. So think of these like the four buckets. Similar to years ago when we were doing our first student investment account, we had four buckets. These are the new buckets, but they're for all six initiatives. 
These are the actual six initiatives that are all within this grant process. The first is the High School Success Grant. And this does have funds attached to it. And this is, um, there's some definitions coming up, but this was formerly known as Measure 98. So that may live in your memory. Also the student investment account, SIA, which you're all pretty familiar with. I do quarterly and annual reporting on SIA. Continuous improvement planning, the SIP plans we have talked about before. Um, this has no funding attached to it, but it is a process that we are required to go through and review annually. Career and technical education, um, we are actually part of a consortium, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, but CTE grants, there are smaller grants associated with this. Everyday Matters is about chronic absenteeism. Again, there's no uh, funding attached to this, but it's an initiative. It used to have funding attached to it when it was funded by Kaiser, but now that no longer exists. So this is just an initiative that kind of goes across all of these different areas. And then finally, early indicator intervention systems. This has a small amount of money attached to it, and this is really about data and systems for um, ninth grade on success and really tracking our students to see how they're doing over time. These is a summary of the program purposes. I'm going to briefly go over them. High school success is really about dropout prevention, improving graduation rates, and college and career readiness. Uh, you may recall that the two main purposes of SIA are to meet student mental health and behavioral needs and increase um, academic achievement and reduce disparities for all student focal groups. Continuous improvement planning is that process where we do um, educator collaboration and data analysis and personal learning and we really kind of set our goals for every year and that's done at every single school site and the district site. Career and technical education, we have a Perkins grant. We're in a consortium actually with the ESD around improving access and participation in education and training programs um, for CTE. Early indicator intervention systems, this is really a development of data collection and analysis as I was talking about before. Previously we used a tool called Schoolzilla. Now we use a tool called MTSS EWS, which I will tell you about at the budget committee. So don't even, just let that go out of your brain. Um, but it's basically a data collection and analysis system so that we are doing progress monitoring along the way as students are growing and learning um, so that we're not waiting for the big summative test to be able to see how our kids are doing. And then Everyday Matters, which I had mentioned was really a, a big focus on student engagement and decreasing chronic absenteeism. This is ODE's graphic that shows the program on the left, kind of the common elements that they all share and how they arrived at those four common goals. The next slide, you may remember, if you stretch way back into your memory bank, um, that when we talk about the initiatives that we're going to develop, we're really looking at three different levers for how we decide what those initiatives will be. The first um, I will start with is input. So that's all of the community engagement and the surveys and the focus groups and even the one-to-one -one interviews that we do with people. Um, the second being data, looking at a picture of how our students are doing now and what our data shows about our students' progress in schools, and the third being um, um, research. What is the research support in terms of effective initiatives? And that um, comes down to working more than just off our feelings. And sometimes we have really big feelings about what we want, but we want to make sure there's a research base to the decisions that we make as well. So uh, we will be required, uh, notice I say we there, to get together a bunch of our artifacts, and I, I'm just speaking to our cabinet team, the board won't have to do this. But we gather certain artifacts that get submitted with our application. One of them will be a student group um, highlights page that's really based on last year's data to look at how different student groups are doing across the district. We will be using Dr. Spitzer's listening session um, feedback from the beginning of the year. That's a great body of community engagement that we can use. We have already done our first strategic planning community survey. It's really the perfect thing to use in this situation because we've asked our whole community and gotten great feedback, many, many responses on what should our focus be. And then we will, uh, we've already actually started our process, but we'll be engaging in many, many focus groups. Our principals are leading the site council and community forums and school staff focus groups. We already had a meeting with our Latinx PAC and asked them some questions and allowed them uh, opportunities to both get the information in Spanish and respond in Spanish. Um, our new vice principal, 
at Candy Lane actually led that effort and did an amazing job. Um, I know that Director Berg will be reaching out to our families um, that have students that experiencing disability and doing a focal group with them. And then also our Educational Equity Advisory Committee that helped our steering committee. We have put out a call to meet with them and I believe that um, because that's within kind of some of our work around surveys with our strategic plan, it fits really beautifully. Leadership team has already provided some feedback. Um, I used questions right out of our uh, annual reporting that they needed to reflect on so that it was in line with what um, we're asked to do. And then we'll be looking for any additional data reports that we can utilize. One opportunity that I potentially have is to get a little bit of uh, ahead of time information from the new student health survey so we get even more student voice. She told me if I asked her for a couple questions, she could give me preliminary data. So I'm gonna take her up on that offer and we'll make sure that we have that included as well. Accountability, I know that people are often um, really curious about how are we held accountable to this amount of money that we are allocating and spending. And it is very robust. I'm only gonna talk to the four things that are starred there. The first are the longitudinal performance growth targets. We are required to develop these, um, but they are not quite in place yet because of some of the data um, inaccuracies or the data holes that we have over the last couple of years, but we will still develop goals and growth targets here. If you look at the navy blue box there, you might recognize that those are the things that are on our at-a-glance reports. So it all um, kind of connects and makes for really good areas to build your growth targets in. Um, progress markers are something that's developed by ODE, and these have to do with uh, journaling questions that I need to answer every quarter about what impact we're seeing, the data um, and evidence of that, and they have three categories, expect to see, like to see, and love to see, of things that they want to know that we're achieving that I need to reflect on as well. Local optional metrics, um, this should be evidence-based and connected to an investment. Um, example is like star data. We have our own local performance assessment within reading and that data is more accessible to us quickly so we'll be using things like that as well. And then finally, annual reporting. Um, you get to hear from me on an annual basis about SIA and that will continue and be something that's then uh, posted on our website for the public. This is the performance framework. It shows the four goals at the top and then how they are measured underneath. Many of these things I've already talked about. Um, I will just draw your attention to the fact that for each one of those goals, there can be progress markers and local optional metrics, if we wish, built into our plan. And then finally, this is the timeline. <laughs> Because we're also going through strategic planning at the same time, I would say that we're kind of in step three through step six right now, and we're working on all of those things simultaneously. You will notice that after we hear some of those desired outcomes through our strategic planning process, the next step is to kind of look at what strategies are we gonna maintain. We've put a lot of things in place through high school success and SIA and our early intervention systems. What do we want to maintain and what needs to change? And so we'll be looking at that critically, really looking at our data and our input, taking that feedback and saying, does this really meet with our desired outcomes and strategy, and then building a plan around that to bring forward to you. And now I'm open to any questions that you may have on that information, or you can absolutely contact me at any time. I just want to make a comment that I do find it interesting uh -huh. that you require a 12-step <laughs> program for yeah. this particular <laughs> brand. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> I was also really impressed with it because it was like, that is very clear where you're, where you're going. So yes. after my joke, I want to say thanks. That was very helpful Of to me. course. <laughs> Many of these slides too will become like our base slides that we'll use over and over and over in our reporting. So um, you'll see them again. Cool. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. I have a comment and two questions. Okay. If I may, thank you. Um, first of all, one thing I really like about this approach is that um, you're you're taking our various ways that we've been having and still have community input, and you're tying it to, frankly, the dollars. You mm -hmm. know? Absolutely. Our strategic planning words will be extremely important. Don't get me wrong but I think everybody appreciates that usually change takes money, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, I hope the community is hearing you and saying that we're not just asking 
for this for the the sake of asking or for that exercise all that that's important too but we get to take that feedback and have it direct our grants mm -hmm. you know and that we can really see action then right correct and I just love to add on to that. Um, we will be having focus groups, mm -hmm. like Dr. DeVoy talked about, with community to um, give feedback on like the priority areas here in the next couple weeks, which will be super important because we will use our funds, both our core and our more funds, to support our priority areas. So we'll be having um, opportunities for people at every school to come and give their input, as well as multiple um, opportunities throughout our district. And those will be up on our website, um, hopefully by the beginning of next week. Uh, and it will be really great to have people chime in. Thank you, Dr. Spitzer. Um, so what were my two questions? I had a question about the Log longitudinal performance growth targets? Yes. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, you mentioned how it can have some overlap or alignment with how One our more, report cards look. Isn't, don't we also, do you also have math, is it also fifth grade math included? No. Um, no, these are like the common metrics that go across. I believe you're thinking of eighth grade math. Is eighth on. grade, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yeah, and the regular attendance rates, to be clear, on the at a glance are K2, but that doesn't mean that we have to focus on K2. That's just what comes forward on our at a glance, and it's a predictive um, type piece of data. So um, those are the common five that are the most okay. looked at, and they all five of those show up on our at a glance, but other information does as well. Okay. So these are sort of the most common five that we find across all the different types of grants. Mm -hmm. but those exactly. Sometimes also pull in other methods. Yes, and so then we might choose, I was actually talking with a partner from another district about this, you might choose to add a different metric you know, or a different performance growth target. It wouldn't have to be these five common, but it makes sense to look at these closely about which of these would be good indicators that we definitely want to include. Okay, and there must be reason these are the five most common. Yes. So it's evidence-based, right. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, that's helpful. The other one I have is about the buckets. So yeah. um, <laughs> can you talk about the fourth bucket a little bit, strength and system and capacity? Just kind of flush that up. Yeah. A little bit it, defined. It is a, a large <laughs> category when you think about it, but really it's about thinking about how your systems come together to support all these other initiatives that you put in place. And so one kind of learning that we have is you could have a lot of amazing initiatives, but with no system underneath it or capacity to manage it, it's very difficult to get that to move forward. So one of your buckets can be around things like data systems, um, things like um, if you have, for instance, all the different data around a, a student and you don't have a good way of organizing that and tracking it over time, or even a person that part of their role is to produce data for us um, and show it to us so that we're in a way that's really digestible and make data into information, it's really, really difficult for you to act quickly with intervention and act quickly with your changes. So we wanna make sure that we invest in some of those systems and the capacity to manage that. See, okay. Yeah, that helps. Thanks, Dr. Great. Boy. I, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, next item interdistrict transfer criteria, Dr. Spitzer. Excellent. Um, so, this is a discussion topic. And um, basically, uh, as you know, we are working on, which is also uh, part of your approval for up for approval tonight is the interdistrict transfer of resident students and at the very end of this policy it says superintendent is directed to, to establish procedures for the review of any student request to attend school in another district so um, we are working on an online and also a paper copy version for people to apply but one of the big missing pieces is how many people can come and go and so um, what you have in front of you and I believe Holly left it for you is um, a proposal for us, but I first want to start with the dig in around what is occurring in neighboring districts. So you'll see, um, looking at our neighbors, some are very, it's on the back side of the uh, interdistrict transfer criteria document. Let me find it. Have one? Yeah. We don't have a back side. <laughs> You'll share. Sure. Problem solving, problem solving, thank you. Um, so some districts just are 
comfortable with just everyone being released. About, mm, I don't know, eight years ago, there was uh, legislation where everyone had to identify by school and by grade level how many they were going to accept and, um, and release. Um, and so some school districts still kind of have that in practice. I think post-COVID, uh, there's just been a really big challenge to try to get kids involved back in school at all. Across the state, we're down like over 30,000 kids. So that's kind of the primary push, like let's just get them back in. But I do think that it's nice to have some criteria. So what I'm proposing um, to you this evening is kind of based on what we see in our neighboring areas that we would allow for district transfer out to neighboring districts, um, a total of 30 students, which is approximately equivalent of one FTE across our district, a full-time educator across our district, with no more than 15 being at any given level, elementary, middle, or high school. Um, and if you look at this document, um, for those who have a restricted number, um, those districts, I think there's three of them listed here. Um, I think for our comparative size, that seems uh, reasonable and in line with them. Um, for district transfers in, it would not to be exceed the district grade level class average size. So specifically, if um, somebody wanted to transfer into Holcomb and the class size, uh, we agreed that the class size ratio is 28.5 to 1. If they had 29 students, we, we might not accept it at that school because um, we don't want to create extremely large class sizes, um, we definitely want to look at the impact. So that would be kind of the, the uh, process there. The big important thing here um, is that the first step in this process for families that choose to transfer in or out, they would speak with the principal first. That cur currently isn't a practice. So whether they do that online or they do that on, on paper, the first conversation would be with the principal to um, talk about what their students' needs are, and especially if they're going to request a move out of our district, um, what, are, what are those needs that either aren't being met or maybe they're building a house in another district and they're preparing for that, want stability, that sort of thing. So having the conversation to make sure that we are serving our students well and that our families um, feel like they can have their students' needs met. So um, let's see what else do I want to say. Um, as a clarification as well, please remember we have four charters and you probably are aware that students can come to a charter school without permission from their district. Those are options. So this would also apply to virtual charter schools. So we have families that choose to send their children to virtual charter schools and that isn't something that would fit under this uh, guidance because they have the right to do that. Same thing with homeschooling or if they chose a private school. So this is just across district lines. The application window, the proposal is March 15th to May 15th. Again, that's mostly for staffing. Um, we're hoping to kind of have our proposed budget to you by April. So opening that a little bit before closing it so that we make sure that we make any adjustments for staffing, especially at the middle and high school level. It's really difficult if you had 20 kids come in to make that adjustment once the school year gets going. So. Um, we would open and close that window. Um, requests to come in or out of our district after that um, would be uh, based on a hardship as defined by um, the Oregon Revised Statutes regarding hardships. So there are, are reasons for um, us to allow that outside the window. Also, uh, we've talked about the fact that there hasn't been fabulous data tracking systems thus far for transfers in and tra transfers out and, and the resources. So based on um, our estimate, it looks like we had about 54 last year total that came out in the spring through the summer. And so I think a 30 would be appropriate, especially as we have those conversations with families and try to mitigate any concerning issues that might be causing them to choose not to be with us. Questions? Of the 54 that left last year, mm -hmm. um, we didn't, did we track if they went to charter, private, other public, home? Um, so, um, Yes, we know from those 54 where they, where they transfer to other schools. The harder thing is, and it, this is true across our state, is we just had so few kids come back mm -hmm. that that was difficult to track. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, we are now moving on to our action items. Um, <clears throat> the first is the consent agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Uh, we don't discuss the consent agenda. Learned that last time. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, Ms. Beck, could you pull the board, please? <laughs> Director Saul? Aye. Director Farmer? Aye. Director Hayes? Aye. Director Stroh? Aye. Director White? Aye. Director Cantola? Aye. Director Philpot? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, consent agenda shall pass. Moving on to individual action items, 2223-417, approve Clackamas ESD local service plan. Do I hear a motion with respect to this action item? Chair Philpott, I will move uh, to approve 2223-417, uh, approve Clackamas ESD local service plan. Second. Second, Director Soule, was that you? Yeah, uh, yeah, if you heard me first, then somebody else. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. Director Sol, second. Um, any discussion? Woo! <laughs> um, hearing none. <laughs> Ms. Beck, could you pull the board, please? Director Farmer? Aye. Director Cantola? Aye. Director Stroh? Aye. Director Hayes? Aye. Director Saul? Aye. Director White? Aye. Director Philpot? Aye. Motion carries. All right, 2223-417, approved Clackamas ESD local service plan shall carry. Mr. Didway, thank you for joining us. Uh, feel free to leave if you would like. You don't have to stay, but you're welcome to stay if you would also like. Um, resolution 2223-418, approved 2023-24, inter-district transfer criteria. Do I hear a motion with respect to this resolution? Chair Philpott, I motion to approve resolution 2223-418. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Beck, could you pull the board, please? Director Hayes? Aye. Director Cantola? Aye. Director Farmer? Aye. Director Soul? Aye. Director White? Aye. Director Stroh? Aye. Director Philpott? Aye. Motion carries. Resolution 2223-418, approve 2023-24, inter-district transfer criteria is approved. Uh, moving on to resolution 2223-233, appoint budget committee member for position seven. Uh, Director White, this is your position. Mm -hmm. We have been supplied with two applications. Mm -hmm. Do you have a particular nomination for the board to consider as part of this resolution? I do. Um, after looking at both of them carefully, they're both very active in the community, really great, sound like really great parents who want to be involved. I uh, want to nominate Ray Stoby, um, just based on the fact that um, kind of a real deep uh, understanding of um, of numbers, basically. He is a credit analyst, he has been a bank manager, he does commercial loans. Um, I just feel like he would be a great addition um, kind of to the nitty gritty of, of a budget, so. Um, but I think that our other candidate, whose first name I believe is Nancy, I can't remember her last name, um, uh, really has a wonderful resume as well and, and uh, really involved in the community and really passionate about equity diver and diversity. And uh, I hope she will continue to get involved with the district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, with the nomination of Ray Stobie, going now to resolution 2223-233, appoint budget committee member for position seven, Ray Stobie. Um, do I hear a motion with respect to this resolution? Well, I will move. 
that we, um, I, I'm lost here, we're at C. Um, resolution 223-233 that we would appoint Ray Stoby uh, to the budget committee member for position seven. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Beck, could you pull the board, please? Director Farmer? Aye. Director Cantola? Aye. Director Sol? Aye. Director Stroh? Aye. Director Hayes? Aye. Director White? Aye. Director Philpott? Aye. Motion carries. Resolution 2223233, adopt budget committee member, or appoint. We're not adopting him. We're not adopting him. We're appointing him. It's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Appoint budget committee member for position seven, Ray Stoby. Thank you. And um, I don't. I don't believe Ray is here. No. I've not met him, but no. um, we'll have a chance to thank him at the next budget committee meeting. Um, moving and on to. I, I have uh, a clarifying question, and I assume Holly, you'll reach out to Ray. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, approve. Uh, next action item D, approve a hearing to review the public complaint appeal dated January 30th, 2023. Do I hear a motion with respect to this agenda item? Motion to approve. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, Ms. Beck, could you pull the board, please? Director Sol? No. Director Farmer? No. Director Stroh? Yes. Director White? Yes. Director Cantola? Yes. Director Hayes? Yes. Director Philpott? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, Motion to approve a hearing to review public complaint appeal dated January 30th, 2023 shall carry. Um, that reaches the end of the action items. Um, I do have a, kind of a side note that is also an item for discussion. It's not really a, a voting item, but it is a, an other action item of the board. We are about to embark upon the evaluation process for the superintendent. That evaluation process has to be completed before our March regular session board meeting. Uh, as Yes, as <laughs> part of that process, um, board leadership met and we believe that the best way to do this is to designate two out of cycle sessions. The first session would be to uh, for the board to meet to review the OSBA criteria for Dr. Spitzer to provide us with evidence and support of each one of those evaluation criteria and then for the board to have an opportunity to deliberate and evaluate that would be the first session the next session would be a session for the board to review its evaluation with Dr. Spitzer. Then ultimately an evaluation synopsis will be published to the public and that will be done at the next regular board session. So that in March, March 13th, because it's just under the deadline of March 15th. <laughs> so the purpose for this um, item on the agenda is I'm asking board members to participate in two separate meetings, not on our normal cycle. And I would envision that those meetings would happen some, the first one sometime next week. And then the second one, either the week of the 27th or the first week of March. And I felt that the best way to get everybody's availability on those things on those dates would be to have it here right now and we can discuss our availability. So these would be executive sessions. And would they be in person? Um, I, yes, my preference 
Okay. There will be a remote option, but my preference would be that they be in person. So I just want to remind my colleagues that I'm leaving on March 1st for Japan, and I will not return till March 18th. And and time being the way it lays out, I'm also unwilling during my vacation time to get up in the middle of the night I, I don't <laughs> and attend a meeting. You. I don't blame you. Would it, would it be an, an acceptable process to you to participate in the first meeting, which would essentially be the evaluation yeah. process, yeah. and then the remainder of the board members could participate in the second one, which is the communication mm -hmm. of the evaluation. Yeah, that's to Dr. fine. Spencer. Yes, I mean, okay. yeah, absolutely. And I, I would be available. I mean, we have a meeting anyway. I think on the twenty seventh, but I would be available on the twenty eighth. I'd make myself available. Just make sure I'm packed the weekend before. I know, right? Okay. So um, I'm, I'm open. Are our board members okay with having a meeting next week? It's a short week. The Monday is a holiday. And I'm gone Tuesday. And you're gone Tuesday. Are you sure you're against slipping it in at the end of the budget committee night? Are you worried that'll just go too late? We on have the 27th? a very, very long session. Yeah. Um, I also hate keeping staff. We have a very late, long so session okay. that, and and I and I feel as if. That's a we need to have designated time for this. Yeah, I think so too. And that we shouldn't stack it against another, a, a very long work session. And the deadline's March 15th? I, was, I don't know why I thought yeah. it was a summer thing. No, <laughs> no, right? A whole right? year of work and then review. <laughs> it's not. Oh, because it's. It, it's in the con, in, oh, because in part of the contract. contract. Can we file I, an extension? I understand, I just didn't know. <laughs> yeah, can we file an extension? <laughs> Uh, so um, so let's look into next week. Um, I'm, I'm hearing mon Monday, no, it's a holiday. Tuesday, I'm hearing no. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? I'm available Thursday. I'm, a, I'm available Thursday, but not Wednesday. I was going to say Thursday. Wednesday, I have meetings until 6.30 at night. So Wednesday? Yeah, I have international calls I have to be on, so it's morning there. Okay, so. raise your hand if Wednesday would be... A day you were are you are available I can we have bargaining okay if we can start late enough for Debbie okay Thursday raise your hand for I can Thursday. I can do it after seven o'clock if it's at seven o'clock past that I can do it on Wednesday nice. but on Thursday I'm wide open Thursday? Thursday's not great for me I just have coffee to fill for <laughs> <laughs> you're a maybe on Thursday but you could do a Wednesday when can we do Wednesday again? If it's uh, if it starts at, it at seven. If it starts seven? at seven, I can do that because my call's uh, at six. Director White can't. So I think yeah. we're doing. I think we're back. Yeah, my meeting starts at six thirty. So okay. Um, and it's once a, only once a quarter, so I don't. I don't so we could also go the following week, hmm. um, and yeah. then we would have a, a, the first meeting the week of the twenty seventh, and then the next meeting would be the first week of. So the only, March. yeah, the only day I can do that, of course, is the 28th, because the following day is the first. And is that something you would want to do, I knowing that you're leaving the next yeah, day? Yeah, we, well, we don't leave till wow. 4 on Wednesday afternoon, though. Okay, so Tuesday, the 20, Tuesday the 28th, is someone looking at a calendar? Yep. Yeah. 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 Not, available till after, available for not available Not available until after 7. Not till after 7? Mm -hmm. 7 would work, though, right? 7 would work, seven yeah. I'm not available till, uh, until 7 o'clock, sure. yeah. Could we do that? Yeah. Is, okay. So Tuesday the 28th at 7 yeah. and then um, someone who has it it'll it'll probably be in the district office boardroom area conference room not really a boardroom okay and then the next week can somebody tell me the dates of the next week yeah it's March uh, 6th 7th 8th 9th and 10th okay so we would need another session um, that week and since Director Wright won't be here, I don't, um, I don't need to. Okay. And I can get back to you an email if there's like condensing. You Absolutely. Yeah. Because yes. I. Because I. It, it'll. <coughs> you'll be a certain amount of work. Yeah. Um, okay. So to that Monday night is. The sixth. I can the do sixth. Monday through Thursday. Monday. Mondays are nice because it psychologically at least we I can do Monday after it doesn't, it doesn't after. feel like it's an extra meeting <laughs> is really. yeah, I can do okay. Monday after Friday Monday actually you could be like we have a meeting tonight it's Monday. Monday at 6 Monday I can the do Monday. 6th at 6 yes yeah. can people do that I can do that okay we have strategic planning on that 
Oh, oh, you do? <coughs> at 4. And I got to zoom in. Yeah. I can zoom in in my, call, or my car when I'm driving here. That's a, lo that's a long day for you. That is insane. That's okay. I'd rather, I mean, I'd rather do that. Then drive back and forth. Yeah. yeah. You would? Okay. Okay. So, m 3, 6 at 6.30 or 7? Seven? 7. We can do 7. Seven? Seven? Yeah, 7. 7. seven. Three, six, and seven. That just keeps, gives you a chance to superintendent ones at seven. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for uh, <coughs> being willing to do that. It's it, it's kind of a process that I think deserves its own individualized attention. So yeah, I understand. we've never done one. So appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Prior. We did, we, we did yes, this did. with with Larry Didway. Yes, yes we did. Kyle, Twice, I think. I. Oh. Okay. It is well. It does a long time. But it's so sorry. Can you recap the dates? Is it two or three times? It's two, two dates. Okay, so we're, not, so we're not doing next week. So this Tuesday, the twenty-eighth, replaces the idea of next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Else. Thank you. Two twenty-eight and three six. Sounds good. Both to at me. seven p.m. Um, prior to that date, uh, Ms. Beck will again supply us with the OSBA rubric, okay. so everybody will have that in advance and can kind of prepare themselves for the evaluation portion following that rubric okay okay, okay. all right now thank you uh the 6th um, or the 28th both are now we have our board seven, member yeah, comments okay. so 28th 28. is at seven. 7 okay yeah thanks i don't know why i'm so and then the 6th is yeah <laughs> gotcha. this is director this is my, this is my tuesday first. Oh my God. So for I am really excited. No, no, no. I'm like, literally, that's my Constant. Tuesday. <laughs> we are still in our meeting, you guys. Hey, hey, we're, we're moving on to board member comments and good news. <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, share a couple things with you. One is that, so when we're looking at AVID, I've heard them talk about, and I've even seen actually one time when I was visiting the concept of the Socratic seminar, but I was like, Hmm, does that mean what I think it does? So I looked it up and this came, you know, I just, you know, you gotta. Anyway, the Socratic seminar is a formal discussion based on a text in which the leader asks open-ended questions. Within the context of the discussion, students listen closely to the comments of others, think critically, critically for themselves, and articulate their own thoughts and their responses to the thoughts of others. They learn to work cooperatively, I can't talk anymore, and to question intelligently and civilly. And I just thought that was a nice thing to know. Um, I went to the equity conference, and I want to reiterate, I don't know if you looked at them carefully, but there were really cool things. Um, there was even something specific to math, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I personally I could not come in the morning, very disappointed uh, not to be able to hear uh, the the keynote speaker, but I did uh, do two. I did um, Restorative Practices 101 and um, Voices of Student Experience, so students with IE, on IEPs who um, talked about their experiences. And um, one of the things, I, I have one thing to say about the restorative practices. I was so impressed with the teacher's interest in truly helping students um, a, a create a collaborative and peaceful um, working environment by um, and by setting boundaries and then by making sure that those who have given offense to have both consequence and also be restored. And I think that sometimes, I, I know that was a misconception for me. So that is very much what it is. And I heard them talk about how important it was. Uh, it was a big group of people and also how hard it was. To, to do on a regular basis. So I was really appreciative of those teachers taking their time and being so vulnerable about um, both what they wanted and, and what the challenges were. Um, so then the voice of the students. So I have to give you the quote of the day. Well, they asked, this was the last thing, and then I'll tell you a couple of things, but the last thing they asked is, what would you say to kids who um, are coming up behind you? And this one young woman who I just found delightful and who had was so articulate and had so many great things to say. But this is, I literally put this up on my mirror. Don't let the bullies bulldoze your flowers. 
<laughs> so this is from someone who'd been bullied. <laughs> don't let the bulldozer, don't let the bullies bulldoze your flowers. And I just thought that was delightful. Two things. One, uh, there were seven kids um, and three seniors, three juniors, and a sophomore. And every one of them said that what made the biggest difference in the classroom for them was that teachers who really cared to get to know them and who under who were open-minded about their IEP needs. Um, and then I just want to repeat. Don't let the bullies bulldoze your flowers. <laughs> I love that. And then finally, I um, just want to reiterate uh, what a great thing the strategic plan um, planning process has been. Um, I had the privilege of working with a teacher and um, a classified person and a student. And um, we just really had a great time talking about the values and, and how we've, you know, coming together with statements around values and mission and vision. So um, there were 40 people in the room and it was, it was well run. Um, it stayed on task, and I really feel like we listened to and heard each other. So that was, and we're listened to. So that was great. Sorry it took so long, but it's been a great couple weeks. <laughs> Director Stroh. I have something to share. <clears throat> the Scarlet Brigade Band will be marching in the hallways on Wednesday <laughs> <laughs> as they gear up for another pile parade to celebrate all the great activities happening at our school this time of year. We are also down to our last two final basketball games, which, which the band is playing. <clears throat> that was exciting. And then the other fun thing, there you go, Mr. Henson, I'm thinking about you. <laughs> The other fun thing is Gaffney Lane is going to bring back Read Across America, and that nice. will be held 227 through March the 3rd, and they're going to have special guest readers read Dr. Seuss to their students, and I'm very excited because this has been gone since COVID, so this is like the first yep. bring it back. So yay, yay Gaffney Lane. Yay. <clears throat> Director Farmer. On the heels of that, I get to be one of the guest speakers who reads to the kids. Yay. <laughs> and it is. It's very exciting. Um, it is. It is. Um, I also want to give, give kudos for um, having integrated basketball back here, being able to have an opportunity for sports for a variety of students, including those, you know, who are experiencing disabilities or some dis delays or it is such a community building um, to have available for all of the students who are playing. Um, and, and when I say I'm so grateful, our families are grateful, their families are grateful, the community is it, it is one that feeds back and to have an outlet, a team that accepts you and embraces you and cheers for you and supports you um, when other teams don't ask you back, when other teams say you don't fit in anymore um, means more than the words I can speak. So I want to say thank you. Director Cachola. I got nothing this week. Nothing? I got nothing. Okay. I'll go. Um, I, the high school hosted the state championship cheer competition, and I was astounded at how many people participated and attended that event. It was a huge heavy lift on the weekend for certain members of our staff. And um, I just want to say thank you because it's not easy to host. I mean, there were buses lined all the way around the school <laughs> because it was such a large event. So um, I know that that must have, uh, have taken a lot of effort on a weekend and I appreciate that. Um, also shout out to um, our wrestlers did very well at districts. Um, we had, I think it was one of our wrestlers was actually di district champion in his weight class. 
Um, so our um, boys and girls wrestling teams, congratulations. We, I think we had a really successful season this year. I have Director nothing. I've, I've had nothing. I've been out of the country. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to catch up right now. Director so. Salt. I was going to pass too, but then I decided to bring something up that was earlier in the agenda because I wanted to add a personal note to it that next Tuesday night, my wife and I get to bring our son to Kinder Connect at Redland. Oh, and I'm excellent. like, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to cry, you know. My first <laughs> baby is going to be five this summer, you know. And, uh, He's my oldest, so I don't have any students in the district. And so I'm pretty excited to finally, finally see what it's like, try to feel what it's like a little bit to have a, a student in the district. Um, I can't wait. And I have all the, the faith in the school. I can't wait. And my son is, I don't know. I guess I shouldn't just get started on him or I just won't be quiet and I'll keep you here. But I, don't, I don't know what it's going to I think it's going to be really scary, right? I mean, you're probably, the parents could tell me that it's a scary yeah. thing, right? So I think this kindergarten cook sounds fantastic. It's going to help him. He needs to see it. He needs to be in the room. And uh, one of you asked the question, like, how are you getting the word out? And we've this, uh, uh, sometimes that comes up during the Kinder Connect presentation. I think it's a tough challenge. You got, we, you, if anybody knows families that it's their, yeah. their oldest is going to be kindergarten and what if they're not? Not only if they're their oldest, maybe they're not connected to the district yet, but also what if they're not in an area of preschool that got the, the information, mm -hmm. which is how I, I knew about it anyway because I'm on the board, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's where we got it from, Oregon City Day School, you know. So keep spreading the word. It's not too late to let people know that come. They get to have the kids in the classroom with the par meeting in parallel. It's brilliant. So it's good. So anyway, thank you again. I just wanted to read up because it was personal. And I <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you all. Um, our next board meeting is a work session on February 27th and then regular session March 13th and then we'll have those executive sessions sprinkled in. Okay, meeting's adjourned. <laughs>